Good morning to everybody. Good morning. Have a coffee. Good morning. Hello. Good morning. Is Valdo? Uh, Hi. Good morning. Hello. Hello, Matt. Good morning. How are you? <laughs> Pretty good. Well, evening for me. The sun is setting. It's a cold and miserable winter day. Oh my goodness. Oh. <laughs> Uh, but that's Wednesday, right? So I mean, uh, I think Eric and uh, and Miguel. Uh, it's also evening, but uh, the day before Tuesday. <laughs> yeah, ah. here it's still Tuesday. Yes, <laughs> it's still Tuesday. <laughs> so once again, like yesterday, we, we have a great um, discrepancy of of time zones, right? So yeah, it's great to see all you guys uh, together. Uh, I think we just need um, Alexei. I did. I did talk to, to Lavinia, but um, unfortunately, mm -hmm. she wasn't. She wasn't into this. Would have been nice to have her as well. Okay, so she won't be here too. Yeah. No, no. Unfortunately, she won't be here. Okay. Okay. Uh, so we can start about um, about five minutes before. Just give it a, a very brief introduction, so we can start at yeah. five five thirty with Miguel, and then carry on with the speakers. Um, Great, right. yeah, that's fine. Mm -hmm. So there's still people joining, so yeah. Yeah, I mean it's still quite early. It's they do arrive on time. Ten minutes. <laughs> yeah. Yesterday we, we had a nice session as well. We had a nice session on the observational signatures of uh, of wormholes, you know, with, with the the rings, the black rings, and the yeah. uh, shadows. It was, it was uh, all very nice, you know. Uh, there were there were a few talks, one or two talks that um, the connection was quite bad, um, so that was quite quite unfortunate. We had a an almost silent movie, Charlie Chaplin movie. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the the speaker lost lost the microphone. She, we we saw her. We saw her cursor moving along the slides, but not her voice. So we just, during 10 minutes, we just followed her, her reasoning, you know? So yeah, that is quite, that's, yeah. That is quite unique. <laughs> because yeah, technology is improving, but still sometimes internet yeah, connections yeah. are bad, right? So uh, that's, that's why we have to say, I mean, it's best to, to see that we have a, a good connection beforehand. Hello, Alex. Good morning. Hello, everybody. Hello, hello. Great talk yesterday. Alex gave a fantastic talk yesterday. He has a, he has a gift well, for this. Thanks very much, Francisco. <laughs> he really has. I mean, I, the first time that, that I heard him speak was about, I don't know, was when I went to, uh, was it Matt in 2019? That, yep. that talk, that is, that is fantastic. Uh, very, very dynamic. <clears throat> Thank you. That's very, very kind of you to say. <laughs> no, no kindness. <laughs> The truth. I'm looking forward to today. <laughs> Thanks oh, for yes, sharing yes, this. Yes, 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 yep. that's true. That's true. We'll it's see. Really nice. Mm -hmm. um, oh, regarding uh, Lavinia, she may yeah. not be here, but she has just revised her article with her and Sean Fell. It showed up, oh. the revision showed up on the archive oh. today. Today? Oh, okay. okay. Well, yep. I missed it. I missed it. I, mean, I haven't seen it yet. Yeah, so. Right. Okay. Okay. It and, claims to be accepted for publication somewhere, but it doesn't let us know where. So. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. Yeah. I did speak with her, but, um, well, you know how, how, how it is with these extreme space times, right? I mean, yep. people don't want to have the names associated to this. So. Oh, come on. I've. I've already attracted far too much attention from the <laughs> UFO crowd in the US. There's but a whole exception. bunch of UFO sure. enthusiasts. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness. Oh, yeah. and, and some of what they're saying is crazy as hell. And, uh, <laughs> oh yeah. I'm sure. I'm sure Miguel as well, right? Miguel was. was yeah. Uh, over right. the years, yes, a lot of crazy. Over the years, people, right. <laughs> I've stopped uh, answering it some time ago oh, because it just that's the best crazy. Strategy. Right. It, same with me. I mean, you just can't respond to all of them, and um, yeah. Oh god, and and some of them you just don't want to respond. You don't want to encourage them. No, no, Actually, no. no. <laughs> yeah. Initially, I, I I used to answer, and then you would find a mistake in, in if they have math calculations. 
you would find that first mistake and tell them this is wrong. And then they would correct that one and make a mistake on the next line and then send it again to you. And it, so it's just <laughs> impossible. <laughs> exactly. So Eric, uh, well, prepare yourself. I'm sure that you've also had uh, your share, right? Uh, since last year. Yeah, yeah. I've built up quite a collection just in these right. past few months even. Oh my yeah. goodness. Yeah. Yeah. Alexei, hello. Oh, good morning. How are you? Good morning. Or good afternoon. Good or the, the first time. Are you? Where are you now uh, at this moment? Uh, I am in Sweden, so uh, it is fresh, 6.30. Hmm? Pleasure. Okay, okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay, it's nice. European time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. See, see. No, for me, it's uh, sunset. The sun is just dropping behind the hills. Uh -huh. mm. So where are you, Matt, then? Australia New Zealand. New Zealand, yeah. New Zealand. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, not even as far over as Australia. That would give me another two hours uh, closer to you, but... Uh... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and believe me, it's real fun when I try to have my uh, meetings with one person in Brazil and one person in Czechoslovakia. But mm -hmm. scheduling gets a real fun. And yeah. it's even worse when I've got another collaboration that involves me in New Zealand, a person in the US, a person in Kyoto, and another person in uh, Italy. Mm. Uh, it sounds completely contradictory. Yeah. In fact, that particular one, we have to have two meetings because there's no way we can get all four of us. <laughs> connected okay. at the same time and have a, a reasonable hours for some, at least yeah. one person would have to be connecting at three in the morning so, yeah. well, it's not even the same day it gets confusing yep. right <laughs> and it's not the same day and so you you have to say uh, you also have to specify this day new zealand time this day brazil time exactly <laughs> There also seems to be like a pressure for people in Australia and New Zealand to also meet at uh, late hours, just somehow because, you know, Europe and America, they tend to, I mean, at least among my collaborators. So, yeah, um, it, at least evening things I can handle. It's, uh, you know, trying to connect at three in the morning, New Zealand time. No, <laughs> okay, <laughs> that's not going to work well. And three in the morning, New Zealand time is, what is it? Uh, just after noon, one, you know, 1 p.m. Uh, in Europe. And so, okay, it's fine for the Europeans, but no, that's not going to be good for me. No, it's not. It's not. Yeah, Europe and America is not too bad. It's just early morning in America, afternoon in Europe, so it's not bad for anyone. <laughs> <laughs> and the one that surprises people is that even Japan and New Zealand, you think same time zone? No, we're four hours different. Oh, mm -hmm. oh wow. Well. Four hours, wow. Well. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. No, I think four hours. Okay. Mm -hmm. Two hours will get you to Australia, and another two hours will get you to Japan <laughs> and Korea. Okay, yeah. <laughs> and it probably switches during the year, right? Because when yes. they're in summertime, you're in wintertime, and it goes, yeah. <laughs> that too. So even with Europe, I mean, it's, it shifts from a 10-hour time difference to a 12-hour time difference. Yeah. And it's not all uniform because, in fact, the week that they switch from summertime to wintertime is not the same as when we will switch from wintertime to summertime. And so you've got to be very careful in between. Yeah. But anyway. We shall see. Yeah, not so many more people connecting yet. Right. Uh -huh. But it's best to start on time. So because of the... Yeah. The propagation of the, the, the delays of time. So just wait one more minute and then I'll, I'll just give a, a, yeah. a very brief introduction. Uh, uh, um, let me see if you can share, uh, Miguel. Yeah, let me just check okay. now. Please have a look. Um, so oh, it should be there great, now. Fantastic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's there. Thank you very much. Okay, it's great. Great. Okay. So, uh -huh. so now I need to stop sharing, but now I don't know how to do that. <laughs> 
uh, you have to, well, you have a button on top, red button. Uh, it says uh, stop sharing uh, some way. Uh, oh, yeah, I saw it. Yeah. Yeah. yeah okay. Uh -huh. Okay. Five twenty-seven. Some people are arriving. We also have uh, Sungwon Kim, also from Korea. Good morning, Sungwon. Okay, so uh, 528, I'll just give it a, a very brief um, introduction, introduction to this, this session. Okay, so thank you, thank, uh, thank you very much all for being present and also thank you for the speakers for accepting to, to be here. It's, uh, I think we have a very great uh, morning session, mini session on the Warp Drive uh, with the recent developments. Um, most of the people had, had, had the papers out uh, with last year or given a talk here, so that'll be very interesting to see the um, these various aspects, right, uh, of the solutions. And um, and we also have the person who started all this back in 94, Miguel Alcubierre, he's also here. So uh, a special thank you to Miguel. I, th I, I believe it's it's the, it's his first technical t uh, talk or in a conference on the Warp Drive, believe it or not. <laughs> yeah, it <is. laughs> uh, many, many outreach talks and uh, he's the Star Trek man. Uh, scientist. <laughs> so anyway, thank you all, uh, all very much for being here. And um, uh, I will I will convene this this mini session, and then uh, Diego will, will take over as, as uh, chair also of, of the session. And um, uh, five twenty nine. Um, I'd like to apologize first of all. Uh, I'm not sure if they hear already, but uh, uh, we had a, a great difficulty in trying to organize the times, to allocate the times to all the speakers. So initially there was a 15 minutes for all the speakers, uh, except for a few also. Uh, but then due to the, uh, the, the main attention that is given to these recent developments on the warp drive, we decided to, give, uh, to allocate more time. So for the people who, there was one talk that was um, sent over, uh, over the uh, deadline, which made us reduce three talks to 10 minutes. So in no way should these speakers think that or, or feel minimized because all the talks are, are important. It's just for practical reasons. So I do apologize for that, okay? Uh, I'm not sure if there's these speakers here, but um, it's just uh, a public apology for, for this. So without further ado, uh, I'll pass the floor to Miguel and uh, he will Thank start off the... Thank you very much, Miguel. Thank you very much, Francisco, for the invitation. So as you were saying, this is the first time I'm going to actually give a, a technical talk on the warp drive. I've given many popular science talks on the subject, but never a technical one. And I'm actually very happy to see that there is, uh, that there is today uh, a whole session dedicated to the warp drive. That's never happened before. So it's a, it's a nice development. And, and it has to do, of course, with all the papers that have come out recently. So I'm happy that people have been working on this subject. But as I should mention that I've never worked again on this subject. I mean, I worked on this in 1994, actually 1992. Uh, and then I published this paper and I never worked again on the subject. So I'm gonna give you a talk on a very old subject that I guess most of you have read. It's the original Warp Drive paper. So there's the, let me just see how do I change the slides here. I don't know how to change slides. It's not a, it's not change a normal process. Your button, your button with the... Uh, yeah, now there right is, yeah. So yeah, so that's uh, that's the reference of the paper, which you have already probably read. It came out in 1994, but the, actually the idea is from 1992 when I was doing my PhD. The original inspiration actually came from inflationary cosmology. The idea that you can have at some point in the early universe uh, regions of, of space that are close together and that have causal connections and can, can, can get... Uh, actually in, in equilibrium. And then uh, this, this field moves them far away from each other such that they're actually uh, outside of causal uh, connection. So they move faster than light away from each other. So that was the original inspiration. If something like that could happen in the early universe, maybe we could make something like that happen in a small case now today, right? So uh, of course, uh, 
you don't actually need inflation to have things moving away from you faster than light in cosmology. Even today, if, 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 if there's galaxies that are sufficiently far away that they move away from us faster than the speed of light, we actually call that the Hubble radius. And it's no big surprise that, that people in cosmology know about this all the time. But the, the, the difference with the inflation is that it postulates that there should exist a field, the, the inflaton field, that increases the speed of expansion dramatically, and that regions that were actually close together and in causal connection eventually are not anymore. So that was the, the original inspiration for the, for the warp drive uh, metric. And of course, just moving away from, from a, speci a specific region faster than light doesn't help you get any, any closer to any other place. So uh, just, just thinking about a violent expansion and exponential expansion is not enough. So the, the, the crucial idea I had at the time was that you can have an expansion behind you and you can have a, a, com, a, a contraction of space, an opposite con, uh, contraction of space in front of you. And that should push you away from whatever is behind you and pull you towards whatever is in front of you. That was the, that was the, the, the first insight. Uh, of course, what, what you're really doing, if you just think about it in terms of geometrical, uh, in, in geometrical terms, you're just intentionally tilting the light cones, right? So you have a region so to, to the left here in this diagram where the light cones are just as, as in Minkowski space. Then you have a region where the light cones are tilted and moves you to the right. And then you have another region far away to the right in which the light cones are just straight again, like in Minkowski space. And this region with the tilted light cones, the idea that it should be able to move around, right? So, so this, is, this is the basic idea behind the, the warp drive geometry. At the time I was working, and I'm still working in numerical relativity. So uh, I was very familiar with the three plus one form of the space-time metric in which you foliate space-time with a, a spatial hypersurfaces. And then you have a, a time coordinate that, that it essentially labels this hypersurfaces. And the interesting thing is this metric, you, most of you probably know them, but if you don't, is that you can rewrite the metric using a series of functions, the lapse function that measures proper time along the, the normal direction. And crucially, the shift vector that tells you how the coordinates move with respect to this normal direction. So the, the actual three plus one metric can be written as I have there in red. This is, uh, this is a space-time metric, and you write it in terms of a lapse function, which measures proper time. The shift vector, which measures this uh, shift in the coordinate positions. And then a, a, a spatial three-dimensional metric that measures uh, distances within these hypersurfaces. So I had this in mind at the time, and, and I thought, how can I use this to actually shift the light cones and tilt the light cones to produce this idea of, of a warp metric that allows you to travel faster than light? And, and what I came up with was that I, I should actually try to simplify everything as much as possible. And that might be the cause of many of the problems that came later because it's, the original metric is very, very simple. So uh, if I'm, I'm only interested in tilting the light cone, so everything else I'll just set to whatever is, is here, right? So uh, I'll concentrate on the shift because actually the shift vector is precisely the one that plays the role of moving you away from the direction, the normal direction in which you would have expected things to go, right? So I, I decided to concentrate on the shift vector and I said everything else to trivial. So in the original ansatz for this, uh, the warp drive metric, I set the lapse function to one because it makes life easier. I set the flat, the, the spatial metric to, to flat metric because again, it makes life easier. And I just concentrated on the shift. So I came up with an ansatz that's down there in red. This is the, the original ansatz for the for the warp drive metric. So the, there's no lapse, the lapse is one, the, the spatial metric is trivial, but this here encodes the shift vector. The shift vector is actually minus the velocity of the normal Eulerian of service. So that's why there's a minus there. And, and the shift vector, I, I chose a very special, a special form. There's actually just a coefficient, this V, this Vs, that tells you at what speed this warp bubble should be moving. Uh, the, the speed is given by V. And then there's a function, which I call the, the shape function, that is essentially something like a top hat function. It should be flat and, uh, and equal to one in a central region. And then it should be zero far away. And it should fall from one to zero in, in a smooth uh, way. And, and, and it should keep close to one in, in a large region inside. So this, this region is what I call the warp bubble. 
and this f is just uh, any any function that is a smooth top hat function. If you read the original paper, in that paper I give an explicit expression for f in terms of uh, hyperbolic tangents, but it, it doesn't really matter. I mean, the explicit expression it could be anything that has these properties. I just wrote that in order to be able to make nice diagrams, so otherwise I wouldn't be able to plot it. But but uh, that shouldn't really matter. The idea is just that it's a uh, is this sort of top cat function. And again, I chose that function to be spherically symmetric around the center of this warp bubble, uh, just for simplicity. Again, it, there's no reason why it should be spherically symmetric, but uh, for simplicity, I took it initially to be spherically symmetric. And then once you've done that, then you have essentially the, the idea of the warp uh, metric is that the thing in red is actually very, very simple. And uh, once you have the metric, you can start calculating things. So once you have the metric from the geometry, you can, for example, calculate the extrinsic curvature tensor of this metric, the second fundamental form. And uh, from the extrinsic curvature, once you have the extrinsic curvature, you take the trace of the extrinsic curvature that gives you the expansion of the volume elements, actually minus the expansion of the volume elements. And from the simple metric I, I wrote down there, then the extrinsic curvature is just that uh, mixed derivatives of the, of the shift, shift vector. So it's this, this partial i, b, j, and, 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 and it's symmetrized. That, that's the expression for the extrinsic temperature. It's actually very simple. And from the expression for the, for the shift vector, which is this top pack function in terms of this function f, this shape function, you can initially calculate first the extrinsic curvature, and then you can calculate the, the, uh, the trace, which gives you the expansion of the volume elements. And if that's this formula in red, it's actually, very, again, a very simple formula. And then you can just plot it to see if it actually does what I wanted it to do, which is expand the volume elements behind you and contract them in front of you. And if you do that, you get this, this diagram that many of you can pro have probably seen. I, it's, it, there's one, one similar to that in my, in my paper. It doesn't look as nice. It, 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 was a, it was not a very nice plotting package, but you get this, this diagram. So in, in, here's the warp bubble. It's moving to the right in the, in the screen. So you have expansion of the volume elements behind the, the warp bubble. Sorry, I just or something. And you have contraction, negative expansion in front of the, of the bubble. And you have a nice flat region in the middle of the bubble where you can sit an object, say a spaceship or whatever you want to put them in there. And in, in the middle of the bubble, space space time is again Minkowski, but it's Minkowski that is actually shifting from, from the point of view of the Minkowski that is outside the bubble. And and that's, that was the whole original idea. So when I came up with this, I was actually very happy to see that you have the expansion, you have the contraction and it looks nice and it does what you wanted to do. So it, it was the basis of the original idea. You can actually go further. Uh, once you have the, the, the metric, you can do many other things. You can, for example, just plug it into Einstein's equations to see what happens with the stress energy tensor. And uh, uh, normally you get very nice nasty equations for the for the whole stress energy tensor but i decided at the, at the moment to concentrate on the energy density which is the simplest part of the of, of the Einstein tensor and i want what i wanted to see was if the energy density was positive negative or what it was at the time i didn't actually know so you it's actually easier not so much to plot into einstein's equations but to just consider what's called the hamiltonian constraint i hope many of you have know what the hamiltonian constraint is it's one of the einstein equations in this three plus one approach that relates uh, the extrinsic curvature and the geometry of the spatial hypersurfaces to the energy density and that's that equation i have here uh, the r is actually the ricci scalar of the spatial metric is the three-dimensional ricci scalar and then you have the trace of the extrinsic curvature and the square of the extrinsic curvature, and that's equal to essentially the energy density, which kill is going to grow. So in the metric I took in the in the warp drive ansatz, the, the flat, this metric was flat, the spatial metric was flat. So you then have this R term, it's zero. And then you just have to deal with the extrinsic curvature, which as I showed you is a very simple expression in terms of the derivative of the shift vector. And when you do that calculation, you end up with this formula in red down there, this expression for the energy density. And the first thing you should note is that this is a negative, right? Everything else on the expression is manifestly positive. It's positive definite, there's squares everywhere. And there's, you have a minus sign. So this shows you that this energy density is negative everywhere. Uh, well, bad luck. At the, uh, when I did this, I was hoping it maybe would turn out to be positive. Actually, I, I should mention an interesting thing. When I first did the calculations, again, for simplicity, I considered the two-dimensional space-time. Instead of four dimensions, I only took X and T. 
And if you do this calculation in a two-dimensional space-time, you end up finding that the stress energy tensor, is the, the, sorry, the, the energy density is zero, which at that time made me really happy because I thought zero is not negative, so that's nice. Uh, but then if you do it in four dimensions, it's not zero. It actually is negative everywhere. And that's that's annoying, but that's that's what it came out. So in the, in the original paper, I just wrote that. I said, well, okay, the energy density is negative. This is probably not very physical, but I gave the standard argument from quantum field theory that in quantum mechanics, you can have negative energy densities like in the Casimir effect. And then maybe this shouldn't be completely unthinkable. We know that in the Casimir effect, you have negative energy density between the, the metallic plates. But again, the energy density in that case is extremely small, but at least it, it, it's allowed in, in quantum mechanics. Uh, but I should stress the fact, because when, when people talk about this, they often say that Miguel Alcubierre found a solution of Einstein's equations. It's not a solution of Einstein's equations, okay? For, us, for solving the Einstein equations, you go the other way around, okay? You, you, you postulate a distribution of matter and energy, and then you plug that into Einstein's equations and solve for the geometry. And that's usually very hard to do, right? That's why we don't have that many exact solutions and why we have numerical relativity because you want to solve these equations. What I did here is just the opposite. It's the same thing that people used to do with wormholes, right? You start with a nice geometry that you like for some reason, you plug it into Einstein's equations, calculate the Einstein tensor and just read off the, the stress energy tensor. That is actually easy. So that, that's trivial, but I, I, I would, wouldn't call this a, a solution of Einstein's equations. It's actually a designer space time. And you just read off the energy density from this, from this designer space time. And in this case, it turns out to be negative. Now, another misconception that people usually have about this is that people tend to think you need a neg negative energy density because of course you have an expansion of, of space time behind this, the, 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 the warp bubble. And that's not the case at all. It's, it's, it's not because of that. Actually, the, if you plot the, the energy density from this expression I have there and you just plot it, this is the diagram you get. Uh, this is a 2D diagram you have to rotate in, in your head around the, the x-axis. It's actually a torus. And again, in, in this, in this uh, figure, the, the warp bubble is moving to the right, towards the right along the x-direction. And you see, that the negative energy density is not along the x direction at all. It's actually on the on the y z directions. It's, it's it goes around in a torus, so it's not behind the bubble. It's actually around it in a torus, uh, and that again explains why my original calculation in two D found a, a, a zero energy density because if you just just calculate this along the x axis, you see that it's zero, right? But if you do it in, in 3D, then it's not zero. So you, you need negative energy densities along the, the, the torus around the warp bubble. Uh, you could then ask, why is it that it's going one way and not the other? Because this is completely symmetric. And that doesn't have to do with the energy density. It actually has to do with the momentum fluxes that I didn't calculate in that case. But if you calculate the momentum fluxes, you then see that there's an, an asymmetry in the momentum flux, but not in the energy density. And when, when I did this, I was disappointed. I just published it like that. It's, well, you need negative energy. It's not very nice, but okay. At, the, at least the space time seems uh, interesting. Uh, I should mention that when I first sent it to a, to, a, to a journal, it was actually a physical review and the referee just answered back saying, you just tilted the light cones. This is not interesting at all, so it shouldn't be published. And then I sent it to classical and quantum gravity and they did publish it. So, but yeah, it, they, they were actually right. Uh, I just still read the line course. But this, this negative energy problem is it's a serious problem, but as we will hear in this talk, to, in later talks today, people have been working on this problem. And apparently it's not a problem at all. I mean, I, I think some people today will show us that uh, you can actually do it with positive energy, which is, I think, a very, very interesting development. But that's not the only problem with the warp drive metric. There's another very serious problem that I realized very early on, and, and, and that's the horizon problem. And the horizon problem has to do with if you want this warp bubble to travel faster than the speed of light. If, if you don't want it to travel faster than the speed of light, then there's no problem, and the, the horizon problem goes away. But, but then it's a very inefficient way to travel slower than light, okay? It, you, you, you have to actually deform space time in a, 
in a very complicated way and you can do it with rockets, so it doesn't make any sense. But if you want to travel faster than light, then there's a second problem. Now, now let us assume that this warp bubble is traveling faster than the speed of light. Then this V, which is this Vs, which is actually the speed of the warp bubble must be larger than C, it's traveling faster than light. But if you go back to the original met, uh, warp drive ansatz, you will find that the speed of light inside the warp bubble is not C, but it's actually minus the shift plus C. And it's minus because, as I mentioned, the shift is minus the speed of the Eulerian observers. And if you substitute the expression for the, for the shift inside the warp bubble, where it's supposed to be essentially just a constant given by the speed of the warp bubble, you find that the speed of, the, of, the, of light inside the warp bubble, I'm assuming that you, you send the light rate towards the front of the bubble, then the speed of that light rate moving towards the front of the bubble as seen from somebody inside, outside the bubble would be V plus C, where V is the speed of the bubble, which is clearly larger than V. But again, we assume that V is larger than C, okay? So this is the inequality you get. While ahead of the bubble, if you're still in Minkowski space time ahead of the warp bubble, then light moves at the standard speed C. So just for continuity, because of continuity, you would expect that it, the speed of light of a light rate moving forward must drop from, from this value of V plus C towards C outside the bubble. And since V is in the middle, it should hit the value of V somewhere in the middle and in, in, the, in, in the middle along the walls of the bubble. So that means that there's a point inside the bubble wall in the front bubble wall where the speed of, of light is equal to the speed of the bubble, okay? So that means that if you're sitting on the, in the bubble inside, say in a spaceship and you shine a laser light towards the front, it will freeze at this point. This is the horizon, okay? From the point of view of the spaceship inside the bubble, the, the light rate wouldn't move any further than that. It will, it will freeze at that point. It'll stop moving from your point of view. It will move at the same speed at which you're moving. But the problem is that this point is inside the wall of the warp drive. It's not actually outside the wall. It's somewhere in the middle of a wall and, and it forms a horizon. You cannot reach, you cannot send any signals. You cannot send light. You cannot send anything beyond that point. But you need some of your, this exotic field in front of that, you need exotic fields all the way to the boundary of the bubble. And that means that if you're sitting inside the bubble, you cannot produce whatever fields are necessary for, to create the warp bubble from within the warp bubble, because there's a region beyond which you cannot reach. That's, that's a horizon and that's a horizon problem. And that's actually a very serious, uh, problem for the warp drive. Right? Uh, you would actually need something traveling faster than light to actually be able to create the bubble in the first place. You need tachyons or something like that to produce the, the warp field ahead. So one solution that I thought at the time would be that somebody could set up the warp bubble from the outside, okay? So somebody could produce the necessary fields from outside, but not within the bubble. And that, that, I think that's the most serious problem with the warp drive. That's probably the reason why I never went back to, to, to work on the warp drive, because when I hit, once I hit this horizon problem, I said, okay, this is something I can't solve. So I just gave up on it, but I'm glad people haven't given up on it. I'm, I'm glad other people have been working on it. So that's essentially what I wanted to talk to you about. I only had 20 minutes, so I didn't want to make it very, this very long, but I wanted to give you an idea of where the original idea came from what were the, the, the main points and what, what, is, what was what I wanted to do at the time and what was the problems that I actually found initially. So I'm gonna, I, I'm gonna uh, finish with that, but I'm just gonna give you some, a few points that I want to, to, to emphasize as, as a final remarks. First point I've actually mentioned in my initial paper that if you could create a warp right, you could probably create closed time curves. And uh, for me, it was pretty obvious that you should be able to do it, but I didn't actually prove it. Uh, Alan Everett proved it in 1995. Also from the very beginning, I thought that maybe there should be a way to do this without negative energy. After all, the inflation, the inflaton field, you can model it with a scalar field with positive energy. It has large negative pressures, but positive energy. So I thought there should be a way to do this without negative energy, but I, I never found it. And I'm glad that some people actually found it recently. I didn't know how to do it, but I suspect that it should be possible. Uh, again, other people uh, uh, have claimed that you need uh, more than the entire energy content of the universe to create a warp bubble that could fit a spaceship. And I'm, I'm, I'm always been very suspect. I, I've never actually liked that argument. They, this argument comes from the quantum inequalities and they demand that the bubble walls should be Planck sized. And I never really believe that that should be the case. If you actually assume that the, uh, the, the walls of the bubble uh, are reasonably thick, 
then the energy requirements become far more reasonable. Still ridiculously large. You still need a good fraction of the mass of the sun uh, to create a warp bubble that could fit a spaceship, but at least it's not more than the entire energy content of the universe. So that's that I think that should not be a, a, a serious trouble. And, and I should also emphasize that the original ansatz for the warp drive metric was extremely simple of, on purpose. I just wanted to find something that represented the idea I had in mind. So I made all the simplifications I could to make this happen. I, I chose the lapse equal to one, the lapse function. I chose the spatial metric to be flat just because that made things simple. I chose a shift vector that only had one component along the direction of motion I was, and was zero along the other two directions. And I chose a warp bubble that was actually spherical. So all these things are extreme simplifications that can certainly be modified to try to fix the problems with the original idea about negative energy and about the amount of negative energy. And that's what people have done recently. They've changed some of these assumptions and they've made things more complicated to try to, to get something more reasonable. I'm, I'm really happy about that. And from my point of view, as I mentioned uh, just in the last slide, this, the biggest problem to me at this point is the horizon problem. I don't really know how to solve the horizon problem. You need tachyons to be able to produce a faster than light warp problem. I, I just have this crazy idea in, in my head, but I've never done any calculations that maybe you could do the transition from the warp bubble to Minkowski space in front in a way that is not continuous, in a discontinuous way. And, and maybe you could have a, a sort of front shock wave in space time in which you, you put the horizon at the edge of the warp bubble. If you could do that, then maybe this problem would go away. And maybe we, could, we should be able to, to, to look at this and maybe think about this Damois, Israeli junction con conditions on, on some sort of discontinuity on the bubble that would take away this, this horizon problem. But I think I've taken all my time now. So those that I just wanted to give you a basic idea what was the original warp drive uh, geometry and where, where the, the inspiration came from. So I don't know if you have any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Miguel, very much. Um, let's, let's allow one question. Uh, okay, Eric, please go ahead. Well, that wasn't a question. That was uh, a oh, okay, a clap. Okay, so <laughs> I, thought, I, a I, thought, I thought it was a raising hand. So, um, if there's one question, one quick question, Miguel, thank you very much for the very nice talk. Alexei, thank you. Quick question, please. Uh, yeah, thank you so much for a wonderful talk. And the quick question is: uh, Can you envision, uh, if it's possible in principle, to have this horizon outside of the location of where the matter is? So, in other words, is it possible to put the horizon? In vacuum region, that would solve the problem with tachyons. But uh, you, do you see any fundamental limitations to this possibility? Yeah, I, I, I don't think so, but I, I might be wrong. I, my, from what I see is the, the the horizon will always be somewhere in the middle of the warp uh, walls of the walls of, of the bubble, and those walls will be in those walls. The stress energy won't won't be trivial. So that. Uh, so that's what I thought that maybe you could make a discontinuous transition, something like that, and, and have sort of shockwave in space time. But this is just a crazy idea. I've never actually done the math on this, so I'm not sure it's going to work. But well, what you mentioned, if you could put it in the vacuum region, that would be fantastic. But I don't really know how to do that. I, I, I'm not sure it would work. Thank you. Okay, so let's thank Miguel uh, again. Thank you very much, Miguel. And thank you. Um, thank you, Miguel. And pass on to Matt. So um, let's see really. Okay, Matt, uh, I think that you can check. All right, thank you. Here we are. Okay, so Matt will be speaking about tractor beams, pressure beams, and stressor beams within the context of GR. So Matt, please. Uh, Matt, please unmute your microphone. Uh, Matt, please unmute your microphone. Unmute. Ah, right. Thank you, thank you, thank you. That's better. Now let me try if I can get this thing full screen. Uh, window, no. Preview, full screen. Oh, for God takes. Never mind. It's going to be like this. Let me make this as large as I can. Okay, so what I'm going to be talking about today is tractor beams, pressor beams, and stressor beams. And of course, 
it's going to fall into the same classification of warp drive and warp drive related space times. So this is work I did, by the way, with uh, Jessica Santiago from Brazil and Sebastian Schuster from Germany. Um, now, both wormholes and warp drives were concepts originally developed within the science fiction community, but they have now for at least 30 odd years been studied and carefully analyzed within the framework of general relativity. Now, in almost all the calculations that have come forth so far, everyone agrees that there are unavoidable violations of the classical energy conditions. Now, that is in fact, the central issue of this morning's little discussion. So I'm expecting a little bit of fireworks to uh, break out. What I was thinking about recently was there's another science fiction trope now over 80 years old, which is the tractor beam or the presser beam, which is something that's straight out of Star Trek. And in fact, I think dates back to Buck Rogers back in the 1920s. And I'm going to try to now reformulate tractor beams and presser beams and something I'm going to call the stressor beam in the context of reverse engineering the space-time metric. So this is like a, going to be a design of space-time similar to what Miguel was talking about. But because I'm thinking of this as a beam, it's like I've got an external generator some arbitrarily advanced civilization is giving us the generator. It's been set up from the outside. Because it's been set up from the outside, I'm not so panic stricken about uh, making it super luminal or making it uh, worrying about the horizon. I just want to know if I can get an attractive force or a repul repulsive force. Certainly, we cannot do anything like this now. Okay. But I'm going to be more interested in asking what the basic principles are for what an arbitrarily advanced civilization might be able to accomplish. Um, and yep, a suitably modified notion of the warp drive will give us tractor beams and presser beams. Uh, and the bad news is, again, you're going to get violations of the classical energy conditions that are utterly unavoidable, but they're not necessarily something to panic about. I say so the key reference is first if you want to go to wormholes look at my book from back in 1995 that's probably the go-to place for wormhole physics but and there's lots of references to the extent literature there but warp drives is something we just put on the archive just a month and a half ago 7th of may uh sorry <clears throat> The tractor beam paper just came out in June, so it's less than one month old now. The um, Our paper on generic warp drives came out two months ago, and uh, we've had some discussion with various people already. Okay, so let me first talk about some generalities about the energy conditions. And I want to emphasize this. The energy conditions are not actually fundamental physics. They are more a warning flag. If you violate the energy conditions, it is a message that there is unusual physics here to be investigated. Um, but it's not an absolute prohibition. And some people try to misinterpret the energy conditions as a way as an absolute prohibition of what can and cannot be done. But instead, what you should think about is if you violate the energy conditions, you should think very carefully about the underlying physics. Examples of violations of the energy conditions, experimental observational, if you believe in the accelerating universe, then we violate the strong energy condition. If you believe in cosmological inflation, again, that violates the strong energy condition. Um, calculations of gravitational vacuum polarization at a test field limit can violate all the energy conditions. Uh, Miguel mentioned the Casimir effect. Again, the Casimir effect certainly violates some of the energy conditions. Um, Hawking radiation, okay, albeit we haven't observed it directly except in analog experiments, but Hawking radiation violates all of the energy conditions. So don't panic if the energy conditions are violated, but do worry about the fact that 
it's not even if you can violate the injury conditions, it doesn't mean it's easy to concentrate the injury condition violating physics in a sufficiently small region to enable interesting effects. And so one of the things with wormholes and warp drives and tractor beams is you not only need to violate the energy conditions, you need the energy conditions to be violations to be concentrated in a small region to make life interesting. And that is where the actual complications come in. The other thing is I should emphasize, if you want to verify the energy conditions are satisfied, then you need to check all time-like observers and all null curves. And implicitly, you need at least some information concerning all the stress energy components. It's not enough to just look at, you know, uh, four out of 10 components. Uh, you really got to think more carefully about all of them. If you want to demonstrate that the energy conditions are violated, then it's sufficient to check that one time-like observer or one null curve violates the energy conditions. And if you want to check that they're violated, it's sufficient to check that some combination of stress energy components violates the energy conditions. Uh, and that's just an important technical point. Let me now give the generic warp metric. And this generalizes the warp metric that Miguel was talking about, because Miguel's version, this vector V, only had one non-zero component, and I'm making it go in the Z direction rather than the X direction. But essentially, everyone agrees that the basic warp drive space times we're looking and interested in are ones that are spatially flat. So delta IJ is, OK, unit lapse. So the thing in front of dt squared is 1. And the flow vector, in order for it to really be a good warp drive, it better be localized. The point is, I do not want to uh, have to accelerate the entire universe. So at a minimum, I want to make sure that this flow vector has some finite transverse size, OK, that it falls off rapidly in transverse directions. I want to be able to make sure that uh, I can turn the warp drive on and off. I don't want to have to be dealing with primordial warp drives that have existed since the uh, beginning of the universe and will exist till the trump of doom. Um, I've gotten used to calling it a flow vector rather than a shift vector just because there's this annoying minus sign uh, between what the people in the ADM formalism typically work with and what is natural within the uh, warp drive community. So call it a flow vector rather than a shift vector. But I do think it's a very good idea to have uh, let it be reasonably general let it satisfy suitable fall off conditions. You want your space time to be asymptotically flat. Otherwise, okay, I don't want to have to rely on Friedman Robertson Walker universe to embed the thing in. Um, that's kind of missing the point. If I'm trying to get from here to Alpha Centauri, the last thing I want to do is have to delicately depend on what the value of the Hubble parameter is right now. So let's not do that. The special cases that are most commonly discussed in the literature, well, this is Mr. Alcubierre's original idea was you just take a flow vector that is pointing in one direction and it just depends on uh, a couple of parameters, VT. In fact, it's uh, that should be VXY. Sorry, there's a typo there, but never mind. It's V of TX is V of TZ, and there's some implicit X and Y dependence as well. Zero expansion is the stuff that uh, Natario worked on about 20 years ago. Uh, and I emphasize Natario's paper is interesting because it basically comes in two halves. So the first half of the paper talks about this generic warp drive and provide some general theorems on these very generic warp drives. 
The second half of his paper talks specifically about zero expansion warp drives. Uh, and you try not to get the two sections confused because uh, Natario already has some very general theorems on the existence of energy condition violations, even in this generic situation. Uh, the thing that's happened over the last uh, year or so is people have now started looking a lot more at zero vorticity uh, flow vectors. So then V is the gradient of a scalar. So if you go back up here, this V is the gradient of a scalar given function to play with, and that does simplify life tremendously. There are further generalizations that are possible but are calculationally intractable. So Vandenbroek in particular made the spatial slices conformally flat rather than totally flat. And yes, you can do that, but there is a price that the analysis becomes much, much more complicated. Other people have looked at the option of putting a non-trivial uh, shift vector, sorry, a non-trivial lapse function in here. Uh, and yes, you can put a non-trivial lapse function in here and it makes things much more complicated. And uh, despite recent claims in the literature, uh, if you put a non-trivial lapse here, or if you put a non-trivial conformal factor here, that's not just a coordinate change, that is actually a serious change in the metric and the space time and a serious uh, complication of the analyses. First thing you want to do to make life simple for yourself is to pick a tetrad and a co-tetrad. And that's simply a matter of convenience. If you really want, you can continue to work in a coordinate basis all the way through your calculation but continuing to work in a coordinate basis uh, is, is awkward. So it's a much better idea to take this metric and use it to read off the coefficients of a suitable co-tetrad and then invert that to find a suitable tetrad. So reading off from the metric, here is your time-like leg of your co-tetrad and then the space-like legs are relatively simple. It's on one, one, and then Vs, 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 because that's just a fact of way of saying, who is dx minus V dt? That's where that's coming from. That now, of course, gives you a four by four matrix, which you can invert to find the time-like leg and the spatial triad. The spatial triad is very simple. The time-like leg is relatively simple because this is just a four velocity of the Eulerian co-moving observer. And if you check carefully, this actually is a four velocity that is normalized, in fact, identically to be um, a four velocity. Na contracted with Na is equal to minus one. All the physics is hiding in the extrinsic curvature of the spatial slices because the intrinsic curvature of spatial slices is zero. The lapse function is zero. So calculations are pretty straightforward. Two pieces of information are very easy. Finding the, uh, finding the Einstein tensor, and this is the Einstein tensor contracted with the, um, with the Eulerian observer. So this is in fact the orthonormal NN component of the Einstein tensor. This is exactly what Miguel was writing down from uh, the Hamiltonian constraint. And of course, the term he had involving the three-dimensional uh, Ricci scalar, that's gone. Okay. And similarly, there is a momentum constraint coming from the ADM formalism, and that one's similarly easy to write down. It's much easier for us now because since everything's spatially flat, I just can do ordinary partial derivatives here. I can do ordinary partial derivatives here. If you go to say references in the ADM formalism, they will typically be doing three dimensional covariant derivatives at this stage. And the reason they have to do that is because they've got three dimensional Christoffel symbols, which are not trivial. Anyway, 
these two pieces of the calculation are very easy and boil down to just reading stuff off from the grouse Kodatsi equations. What is somewhat messier is to write down the spatial components of the Einstein tensor. And this is the least unpleasant version I've come up with. Uh, it involves Lie derivatives of the extrinsic curvature. It involves quadratic terms in the extrinsic curvature. And it's just something you have to force yourself to sit down and calculate. And I emphasize just knowing these components of the Einstein tensor is not really enough to do everything you want. You really need to have all of the components of the Einstein tensor, at least in the back of your mind, before you can do anything reasonable in terms of, say, looking at, well, once I've got the Einstein tensor, because this is a purely geometric calculation, you take the metric, you calculate the Einstein tensor. I now say, assume we're in standard general relativity and use the Einstein equations to read off the energy density, the flux and the spatial stresses. And the energy density, co-moving energy density, this is the energy density seen by a person moving with four velocity n, which is the Eulerian observer. And after you grind through a bit of a calculation, and I invite you to look at uh, the paper for all the technical stuff, you find that the uh, co-moving energy density is actually a three divergence plus something that's negative semi-definite. And that is what's gonna come and bite us when it comes to analyzing energy conditions, including the weak energy condition. Here you've got something that is a three divergence. So, ooh, let's see what's gonna happen with that. Hold that thought. The flux is also relatively easy. This is now the flux as seen by a co-moving observer. And that is a vector which turns out to be the curl of the curl of the flow vector. So in particular, if you've got a zero vorticity warp drive, this is zero, these fluxes are zero, which simplifies life quite a bit. When you're dealing with uh, the zero vorticity warp drive, this term is gone and the energy density is a pure divergence. The one that's more of a mess is trying to analyze the spatial stresses yeah, it's still Lie derivatives of uh, extrinsic curvatures, quadratic terms and extrinsic curvatures. And yes, if you're really going to analyze the energy conditions, you're going to need to look at all of these components. One trick I've found to simplify life a little bit is to look at the average pressure, which is simply the three dimensional trace of the spatial stresses. So you're looking at one third of the average uh, stresses over the spatial slices. And <clears throat> that object is a little bit easier to play with. And in fact, you can take this and convert the Lie derivative into a covariant derivative. Um, and then there's actually a very simple result that this average pressure is related to the co-moving energy density plus a pure divergence. So there's a number of ways you can go from here. You can look at rho plus three P bar and out calculate it in terms of Lie derivatives like extrinsic curvature, rho plus P bar. These objects are useful when investigating violations of the strong energy condition and the null energy condition respectively. Um, it takes a bit of an extra exercise to show that the strong energy condition implies that this thing must be positive. The null energy condition implies that this thing must be positive. The implication is only one way. It doesn't run in the opposite direction. But if you can show that this thing is negative, you know you violated the strong energy condition. If you can show that this thing is negative, you know you violated the null energy condition. Now, everything in this couple of slides is completely generic 
to both warp drives and what I'm going to talk about, which are the tractor presser stressor beams. So what I'm going to do for tractor presser stressor beams is I'm going to modify the warp drive geometry by letting the flow vector be something very specific that amounts to just having a beam pointed in the z direction for convenience. And I'm going to make my beam one of cylindrical symmetry. Okay, we're going to have just fun that, you know, it's going to be straight out of Star Trek. The beam is actually going to beam, be a beam with a circular symmetry. So I'm going to write it this way as a flow vector that depends on two envelope functions, K and V, and two profile functions, H and F. You want the beam to die off rapidly as you move away from the z-axis. So h of x squared plus y squared better be something that falls off rapidly to make it uh, something that's actually a beam. Uh, the x and the y are here are just to maintain the uh, suitable symmetry. If I want the thing to be uh, have exhibit a cylindrical symmetry, I better put x and y in here explicitly. Um, K of T and Z will tell you how the beam gets switched on and off and how far it points. Uh, and you can then try and calculate the uh, forces that a warp field, a beam field <coughs> like this would exert on some target. And there are two approximations in which you can work. You can work in the narrow beam approximation where the beam is very small compared to the size of the target. And then what you want to do is find TZZ and integrate it uh, over all space. Um, and that'll give it a force you're exerting on your target. On the other hand, if you've got a very wide beam where the target is much smaller than the beam, you just want to calculate TZZ on the axis and you multiply this here by the air cross-sectional area of your target. That'll give you the force. And you can just cheerfully go ahead, take this, plug it into the Einstein tensor, calculate the stress energy tensor, calculate the forces and, ooh, for convenience, I define U equals X squared plus Y squared and the result of a messy calculation is that for a narrow beam, I can actually calculate the force at time t at position z on some target. And it depends on integrating over the cross-sectional area of the beam, something that depends on the uh, profile functions, f and h. But then it also depends on the um, envelope functions V and K. Now there's one term there that's manifestly positive and one that's manifestly negative, which means depending on your choice of envelope functions and profile functions, you can either get a beam that pulls something towards you or something that pushes something away from you. So it can either be a tractor or a presser. And similar I, things happen sorry, in the point Okay, Sorry. similar Sorry. things happen in the wide beam approximation. In the wide beam approximation, of course, you just need to know what's happening on the axis. So you only wind up with the value of the profile functions on the axis. But again, you get something that can be of indefinite sign and it will depend delicately on the envelope functions and you can allow either tractor or presser beams. There's a lot of special cases to study. And so the modified Alcubierre one is particularly simple. It's always a tractor beam, it turns out. The zero expansion one has other simplifications. The zero vorticity one is interesting because in the narrow beam approximation, you always get a zero force. And what happens then with the zero vorticity uh, beam is part of your target is attracted towards you, other parts are repelled from you. And that's what I mean by a stressor beam is where the force varies across the size of the target to alternately push or pull. You can 
tune these things in a wide variety of ways. And I invite you to have a look at the paper for some 30 or 40 pages of technical calculations. Okay, so specifics of the energy conditions. Um, yes, all of the classical pointwise energy conditions are violated. Much of this has been well known for over 20 years. And even uh, Natario's paper from 20 years ago, uh, he showed that even the most generic of his generic warp drives would violate the strong energy condition. Uh, and there have been follow-up papers over the years, so it's now known that many other things are violated. But what is true generic to either track or warp drive configurations is this co-moving energy density is a divergence minus something depending on the vorticity. So if I integrate D3x over the spatial slice, as long as I really have a warp drive or a tractor presser stressor that actually falls off sufficiently rapidly infinity so I can do a integration by parts, this one goes away and I'm left with something that is less than or equal to zero. The least obnoxious thing is here if you've got zero vorticity. So a zero vorticity warp drive, you would get the integral of rho d3x is zero. But then you're in a situation where if there's anywhere in your warp drive that the energy density goes positive, it's got to go negative somewhere else. And so the weak energy condition dies right there. Um, Null energy condition, similar sort of games. You have to look at this formula I wrote down for the average pressure. So you need to check that this formula is correct and that co-moving density and average pressure are related by a divergence. If I then integrate this, well, if I integrate D3x, I don't quite get rid of this because this is a four-dimensional divergence but I get rid of the three dimensional bits and the bits that's left over is just integral spatial integral of the time derivative of K. And if I now look at rho plus P bar integrated D3X, okay, I've got this term that's definitely, well, negative semi-definite, I'm just sure in a zero vorticity warp drive. Um, and then you've got this extra bit, but again, if this thing is uh, localized, then I can cheerfully inter switch those. And if it's localized, in fact, the spatial integral of K had better be zero because K itself is a divergence. And so if it's localized, you've got rho plus B and the null energy condition dies. So I would argue that all of the classical pointwise energy conditions are violated. And let me conclude rapidly that yes, all of these things, wormholes, warp drive, tractor beams, pressor beams, stressor beams, they can be analyzed using the tools of standard general relativity. They are designer space times. You are reverse engineering in the sense that you write down a interesting metric and you work backwards to try and figure out what the uh, required stress energy is to support it. Um, I know uh, people will disagree with me on this, but I'm sticking to my guns here. Wormholes, warp drives, and tractor beams are all violate the standard pointwise energy conditions. I would emphasize, even if you go to modified theories of gravity, you will still violate the null convergence condition and the timeline convergence condition. So you, you can't, And often it means in modified theories of gravity, you can rewrite your equations of motion to be of the form effective stress energy is related to Einstein tensor. And you'd still be able to make these sorts of statements about the effective uh, stress energy tensor. But I will emphasize violation of the energy conditions is not an absolute prohibition. It is an invitation to think very, very carefully about the underlying physics. And that's it, thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Max. Uh, we have a time, well, we have time for one question, please. Um, we, we were a bit over time, mm -hmm. but one question, please. 
Alexi. Oh, that was. Oh, I can't. I can't see who's raising the hand. But uh, anybody who wants to speak can. Oh, Alexi, please. Well, I was laughing, but I can just as well ask a question. Uh, so, um, well, uh, Matt, thank you so very much for a great talk. And uh, I was just wondering, so in the very beginning, you put constraints saying that the space is flat, uh, the, the spatial component of the metric is flat, and the uh, the, the lapse function is unity. So, um, yeah. so do you foresee that the deviation from these assumptions would make uh, any energy conditions satisfied easier? These... Uh... Allowing the spatial slices to be formally flat is actually what uh, Vandenbroek did in one of his papers. And I won't say it's going to make life easier. It might make it easier to satisfy the energy conditions. It will make it much, much more difficult to do the actual calculation. Because one of the key things of the Notario generic metric, which is the one I wrote down, is you can do everything using three-dimensional partial derivatives, you never need to worry about three-dimensional Christoffel symbols. Uh, as soon as you go to a Vandenbroek metric or even to this non-zero lapse metric, uh, things get much, much more complicated. So I think there's a possibility you could do something there to improve the energy condition situation, but uh, I think it's by no means guaranteed and it certainly is well beyond any of the discussion points in any of the uh, recent papers on warp drives that come out over the last year or so. So let's thank Matt again. Uh, Matt, thank you very much for a very nice talk. We're 10 minutes over time already, so we have to move on whilst the organizers will, will just switch off the uh, session and hopefully not cut off any speakers. So um, let's... Uh, let, Let's go on to Eric Lenz, and he will speak about hyperfast positive energy day, energy warp drives. So Eric, thank you very much. Please go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so can somebody please confirm that I can see my slides? Yes, yes, it's fine. Yes, okay, thank you. All right. So now that uh, Matt has uh, laid out some fireworks in the uh, spirit of uh, yeah. US Independence Day, I suppose I should light off some. Uh, all right, so I'm going to say something controversial, especially in, uh, considering the previous talk, uh, namely that my uh, paper over the last year uh, claims that general relativity in fact does uh, permit superluminal warp drives that obey the weak energy condition. Uh, and I do, I, I have read uh, Matt's papers from uh, the previous couple of months and I do have uh, a response to them that I'm going to try and sprinkle throughout the slides. Uh, but if I don't address it uh, sufficiently properly by the end, uh, please ask me in the q and I'm gonna try and get through these slides so we actually have some time at the end for uh, a little bit of discussion. All right, so the slides I'm gonna try and get through. Uh, very quickly, I'm going to, I uh, probably don't need to talk too much about the first two topics since they were covered pretty extensively in the first two talks just the general backdrop of what sort of class of space times we're looking at, the general problems with previous work in warp drives, and then get into more of uh, the approach that I took uh, last year, uh, these various sets of rules that I came up with to uh, try and create an example of a positive energy soliton that could travel at arbitrary speed, go over some of the characteristics of that example, Soliton, where I'll then talk about some of the context of uh, the recent uh, papers, and then places I'd like to uh, take the research hereafter. Okay, uh, I'm just using the same uh, ADM breakdown of uh, space-time as has been talked about in the previous two talks. Further, I'm simplifying myself to the Notario class uh, space-times where I'm making these uh, space-like hypersurfaces flat and real and lapse functions unity. And really the only interesting part of the geometry is uh, the shift vector. Um, we've also reviewed uh, some of the problems with the original warp drives, uh, the Occhietti drive, the Natario drive, uh, namely that first off, uh, they violate the weak energy condition very obviously. 
Uh, they violate other energy conditions, but this is the one that uh, uh, is, uh, is perhaps the most obvious uh, to see. Um, in fact, as, as Matt also indicated, there have been a number of papers that have elevated this assertion that a negative energy uh, is required to create one of these drives to the, the state of proof that there are uh, put forth state of mathematical proofs by Olam and others that uh, supposedly this is a requirement for anything that fills the definition of a superluminal spacetime. Uh, having read all this uh, in the previous year, I still couldn't get over the, um, the general Eulerian energy density form. Eric, uh, for I'm, sorry to, I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt. Are you changing your, your slides? I will be changing my slides. Oh, I'm are, sorry. Are you okay. not seeing my slides change? Well, the, no, no, it's still on the first slide. Oh, my goodness. Oh, I'm very sorry. Uh, hold on. I'm going to escape. Um, let's see. Hold on. I will Maybe stop sharing and resume yeah, sharing. Yeah. Sure. Thank you mm -hmm. for telling me before I got any further. Uh, okay, we'll just not do full screen. I'm sorry, this is, appears to be a problem with full screen. Okay. Thank you, Francisco. Oh, wait. Okay, thank you. Can, can you see my? Yes, yes. Okay, hold on, actually. Uh, let me try it again, because I think I'll just encounter the same problem again. My apologies. Okay, all right. Uh, so to review, uh, so you can see what I was talking about, even though you couldn't see it at the time. Uh, I was just talking about the general setup of the space time, the uh, energy conditions, and where I was going to uh, at the moment uh, was looking at this general energy density form. That you know, these two terms of the extrinsic curvature, one is positive, the uh, trace squared of the extrinsic curvature, and the other negative being the uh, extrinsic curvature squared trace. Uh, and if one could possibly dominate, if the positive could possibly dominate the other, this was the idea that I had got into my head that I couldn't quite get out, that I wanted to see if there's any part of uh, the general solution space of these Notario class space times that could satisfy what we normally think of as a warp drive, that it is compact, that it's moving coherently and can move with arbitrary speed and also satisfies the weak energy condition at the very least. If you simplify this in terms of specifically what you get with the Notario class space time, you still see that uh, there's a possibility for a non-negative uh, energy density at any particular point, uh, namely in the form of these uh, uh, three terms of indeterminate type that must dominate over these negative definite terms in the second line here. And so the uh, charge I put in front of me was, is there, some set of solution space that you can find that uh, you can make a designer space time uh, that at the very least satisfies the weak energy condition where this, um, these blue highlighted terms dominate over the remaining negative definite terms. Uh, how I tried to do this was also by making a uh, space time as simple as possible to be more conducive to calculation. How I did that was making one of these zero vorticity space times. I, uh, defined a potential function whose gradient equaled the uh, shift vector components. Uh, further, I noticed that in the literature that uh, the relations between the shift vector components uh, hadn't really been explored under uh, hyperbolic relations. So I wanted to investigate that to see if maybe there was uh, some hidden uh, portion of solution space uh, that could be more easily seen uh, under those uh, types of relationships. So I chose the simplest one I could think of, which was a linear wave equation uh, that existed just purely on the hypersurface where I uh, took the Z direction to be the analog of uh, the time direction for this uh, wave-like equation. Also introducing a, a source function from which I will define uh, the rest of the geometry, this uh, source function row here, instead of being an energy density of the light, just think of it as some mathematical object that I'm going to use uh, via Green's function expressions to define the, the shift vector, extrinsic curvature, et cetera. Uh, and we can think of how the behavior of some source uh, function will propagate 
over this hypersurface in a similar way as we would a normal uh, linear wave equation. Right, so we have uh, these simplifications. I should mention one other simplification that will uh, end up being important is that I wanted to make it uh, fairly straightforward to determine uh, how the energy locally would be uh, positive definite um, in three dimensions. So I simplified the X, Y directions, these directions that are uh, transverse to the direction of motion. Uh, like that, I also chose Z to be the primary direction of motion for the soliton. Uh, that the X, Y directions were related uh, by an L1 norm uh, for the source function, which simplified the rest of the uh, uh, energy expression significantly enough that it was fairly straightforward to see what conditions uh, would be sufficient to make a positive energy density. So expression one is uh, the explicit form of the energy density under those uh, simplifications. Two is an expression that you can, a lower bound expression that you can uh, form in order to help define at least uh, what uh, simpler expression would be sufficient in order to locally have the energy, the oil layer and energy density be at least non-negative. And that I took uh, expanded in terms of its Green's function form uh, for the second Z derivative of the uh, potential function uh, in order to determine how that relation relates to this source function rho. And simply stated, the rule, the final rule that I came up with uh, was that uh, at any one point uh, of, this, of the hypersurface, uh, along the pa past, again, we're using Z direction as this uh, time analog um, or time stand in, that the past uh, wave cone of that point, the integrated dense uh, gradient of the density along that, uh, along those paths had to be the same sign as the density at that, as the hyperbolic source function density at that point. And if, so long as that was satisfied, along with the other conditions we've already implemented, the energy will be non-negative. Okay, so under these rules, uh, here is the simplest uh, warp drive soliton I could come up with uh, that satisfied all of these rules and also gave us the general um, qualities that we normally associate with a warp drive, namely that compact soliton has a nice flat cent uh, region in its center uh, for uh, observers to, uh, uh, to move along with the central motion of the soliton uh, very gently. Uh, this first slide gives us the uh, source function explicitly. So we see green sources, pink sinks uh, for, the, um, for our geometry. Uh, you can think of how these things would, prop, uh, would uh, manifest themselves in the geometry in that if you have a source, it propagates along producing uh, non-trivial uh, shift vector along its future wave cones. And so in order to satisfy the soliton nature, its compactness, et cetera, you want to have uh, sources and sinks organized in such a way that they're going to cancel any uh, rays of, um, of your shift vector that will uh, propagate out to infinity. All right. Here is the uh, shift vector shown explicitly. Blue, so the soliton is moving to screen right. Uh, blue, uh, in the leftmost panel is in that direction of motion. Red is in the opposite direction of motion. So the left panel is the Z direction of the shift vector. The uh, right panel is the transverse direction, uh, uh, tra transverse direction component of the shift vector. So we'll notice that this looks quite a bit different than, uh, the, uh, than Miguel's uh, soliton in that it has multiple domains. It's not just a single top hat, but it has multiple uh, different regions of within them relatively flat uh, shift vector, but these domains vary uh, with uh, relative to each other, perhaps quite differently. Here we have the central region that we normally associate with the warp drive moving, uh, co-moving with the overall motion of the soliton, but directly next to that is a region where the shift vector is pointed in the opposite direction with magnitude roughly twice that of the central region. 
Should also note that the shift vector uh, for these for this example uh, has total shift vector in each direction uh, integrated, and in, they integrate out to zero. So as opposed to having a single top hat that will integrate out to some uh, total uh, non-zero value, here we have something that overall has um, has no net shift, if, if that is a sensible term. Uh, here we have the energy density. Uh, as uh, Matt mentioned, the momentum flux for this um, particular space time is trivial. Uh, you also notice that the highest concentration of the energy density coincides with the locations of the hyperbolic sources and sinks, although the sign of the energy here is everywhere positive or non-negative. Also note that the total energy required, the total integrated energy uh, here, which is uh, where Matt and I are gonna differ, is positive and it still amounts to magnitude order that of uh, uh, some fraction of the sun for this typical figure that's been put out for a, a hundred meter radius um, warp drive with uh, the sh a shell thickness here indicated by the thickness of these uh, little bands here uh, on the order of a meter. Uh, let's see, wanted to go over the other geometric qualities. Uh, so this volume expansion factor also looks fairly different from uh, Miguel's uh, soliton, where we have a, a small um, uh, superposition of the uh, volume expansion factor in, along the lattice here, as well as the energy density in this outer toroid here. Uh, you'll notice, as Miguel mentioned, that the um, regions of high extrinsic curvature and the regions of high uh, energy density are maximally displaced from one another in this space time, uh, in his space time. In this particular example of a positive energy warp drive, we have uh, near alignment uh, of the high energy density, high extrinsic curvature regions. That and the uh, extrinsic curvature regions also surround the uh, entire soliton. So we have both positive and negative um, expansions and contractions uh, surrounding, um, essentially, in, uh, you can find them if you look just about any direction, if you're in this central flat region. Uh, the, uh, in order to wrap up the uh, weak energy condition, because just having the Eulerian energy density is insufficient to claim uh, the satisfaction of the weak energy condition, you also need to have knowledge of the stress. You can look for this very simple uh, case at uh, the trace condition. Uh, from there, you can form limits on the principal values of uh, stress in this space time. And from there, you can uh, therefore see whether or not the weak energy condition is actually satisfied. And for uh, the final published version of this work, uh, the geometry uh, it was shown to satisfy the weak energy condition. Now that still uh, requires, I should actually see how I'm doing on time. How am I doing on time, Francisco? I didn't hear that. Not very well, not very well, but, uh, okay. but make it about three minutes. Okay, That's fine I'll, I'll, I'll try and be fast. Thank you. Uh, in fact, I'll, I, I'll, I'll just skip future work because I think that's gonna be talked about. It's already been talked about. Uh, I did want to mention um, where Matt and my uh, work differs because I, I read his papers. I'm just gonna go straight to, I, I made this into a backup slide. Um, I, I read the papers. I, I looked at this uh, divergence argument for the uh, vorticity less uh, space times where the total energy integrated looked like it just integrated to a total divergence and you can apply uh, Stokes theorem and see so long as your boundary was well outside the soliton, um, you would have to have zero integrated uh, total energy. And so I thought about this uh, for a while and then it occurred to me that the soliton that I created, uh, while it was uh, smooth, it produced a smooth shift vector, um, it produced a nice and continuous um, Intrinsic, cur extrinsic curvature, it did not necessarily satisfy all the conditions of Stokes theorem. It didn't provide a smooth uh, vector field. In this case, I've written uh, Q for that uh, vector field that ends up being uh, the flux through the, uh, the surface of your integrated region. 
And because of that, you need to implement a patchwork uh, version of Stokes' theorem, where each individual region is itself uh, has a smooth vector field. Uh, in order to do that, because of the way that I constructed it, uh, namely because of this L1 norm, you have to divide the region into subregions where the boundary can go out to R equals infinity, but it then must also enter into the origin of the soliton. And because it enters into the origin of the soliton, you can no longer claim that the total flux is going to be zero and there are going to be discontinuities or near dis effectively discontinuities over uh, the adjacent surfaces of the different regions that are going to give you a net non-zero result. Uh, and so with that, I am, I'll just go back to my uh, summary slide, even though I didn't go through all, all the slides exactly in order, and ask for any questions. Thank you, Eric. Thank you very much for a very nice talk. Um, questions, comments? Matt? Please go okay. ahead. Um, I, I am still deeply concerned that your analysis doesn't really try to, it, you don't really have a soliton there. You have more an assertion that here is a warp drive configuration. Let me assume that that can be matched with a soliton that, uh, that satisfies uh, hydrodynamic and uh, Maxwell equations, but you never actually prove that that works. And your trace condition, I think, is not enough. Is that supposed to be a three-dimensional trace or a four-dimensional trace? Uh, so that's a so the trace condition, as presented on the slide, is a four-dimensional trace. A four-dimensional trace. But, but that's but, simply not enough. I mean, that is... Uh, it's not enough, but in combination with the uh, Eulerian er energy density and the symmetries no. of the particular soliton, you can discern bounds on the stresses, the principal stresses, which are really the, no, I the mean, values that, that um, are of concern. And as for the um, having explicitly solved each component of uh, Maxwell's equations for this, uh, this plasma in, in the paper, uh, it's true. I did not solve explicitly, every, you know, I did not do the full numerical relativity treatment uh, for each component. Uh, the discussion about the stress, uh, sorry, about the, the plasma is more to talk about what sort of qualities it would need to have. And there's still other um, problems, the, the horizon problem, the dominant energy okay. condition, when, when you pass uh, the, uh, the speed of light uh, is, is still an issue. This was uh, in one of the previous slides that unfortunately I had to gloss over. Um, and the, the, so uh, okay, I, I will obviously have to think more carefully about okay. your patchwise uh, application of Gauss's theorem, but uh, let, let's just say I am still uh, extremely concerned that I think your analysis is is incomplete in the sense that you don't really have a soliton, at least you don't have enough yet to prove that you've got a soliton. If you could actually- Well, by soliton, you mean something that's compact in size and coherent um, in its actually, motion or what, what do you mean? Like, the point is you write down your metric from which you can calculate an Einstein tensor. You write down a model for what you think the source is, which okay. is a, a fluid coupled to electromagnetism, but you actually need to show that that stress energy coming from the fluid plus electromagnetism actually is sufficient to describe the uh, Einstein tensor of the spatial geometry you started from. Okay. And I, that hasn't been done. Okay, so yeah, you, you are wanting to see the full, uh, the full treatment of the source as well. Yeah, that, that's something that I'm, I'm endeavoring to, to provide. Okay. Uh, the soliton might look a little bit different in the end, but, uh, but yeah, that, that's something that I also would like okay. to see. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much for the comments and the reply. We really have to move on, okay? So uh, if you want to continue the discussion uh, in the chat privately or not, you know, please, please go ahead, but, um, but we, we have to move on. So the, let me invite the next speaker. 
Okay. Alexei, uh, please, when you're ready, to share your screen. Yes, okay. thank you so much. So, Alexei, please go ahead, okay? So, Alexei will be speaking about introducing physical warp drives. Uh, all right, thank you so much. Uh, great pleasure to be here. And uh, in this talk, I'm going to be talking about, again, warp drives and about trying to make them as physical as possible. And that's pretty much based on the paper we wrote together with Gianni Martiri, but which has also been conceived through discussions with many people in and outside of the field. Uh, so uh, let's start with first, uh, with coming back to the Alcubier warp drive proposed by Miguel, uh, because it's a prototypical uh, type of warp drive. So uh, the, uh, the, the, the idea of the Alcubier drive really is that um, there is a metric which uh, essentially um, could be thought of as a flat metric everywhere apart from some region, which is a bubble. Um, some sort of bubble, which is defined by the function f uh, from the rs. rs is the distance from the center of the bubble. So in other words, we have a space-time wherein there is everywhere flatness, and there is a bubble uh, moving in that flat space-time background. Uh, the, the, the function f from rs, which defines the bubble, is uh, has been chosen to be sharply fall in top hat function, but it can also be some other function. It doesn't have to be spherical symmetrical, but it's, uh, it's such a function. Uh, and the good thing about the uh, alpha geometric is that one could place a time-like observer in that bubble and have it move with any velocity relative to the background. Uh, any velocity meaning that it can be larger than the speed of light. Uh, the constraint is that there is a negative energy requirement for the Alcubierre drive. Uh, and that uh, was one of the major constraints there. And there are also quite a host of uh, things related to the superluminal uh, case when the velocity of the bubble is larger than the speed of light. In other words, there are event horizons, there's causality issues, there's a lot of other uh, issues which I'm not going to be talking about. Now, I would like to uh, make a small step and uh, think about subluminal solutions for a moment. Uh, that is because, in particular, the subliminal solutions are quite interesting in themselves. Well, I mean, uh, imagine we have a warp drive which could move, for example, with a velocity of 0.75 uh, times of the speed of light. That would be already quite great a, a device if you would like to think about it as a practical thing. Um, but uh, here are a few points I would like to just uh, suggest about the uh, subliminal solutions. Uh, and the point number one is that there is no self-acceleration in Alcubierre solution. Uh, the reason for that is that there is this velocity term in the metric. Uh, in, the, in the original paper, and uh, also since then, sometimes it's mentioned that the velocity can be a function of time. But if you think about it, so if we put velocity equal to zero, uh, then this term disappears and the whole metric becomes Minkowski. So in other words, we can think of a space-time, like Alcubierre space-time, wherein the velocity has been equal to zero from minus infinity till now, uh, which means that you know it's a pure Minkowski space-time. And then on top of that, we also know that general relativity is a deterministic theory. So in other words, if you specify the metric and all its derivative on some hypersurface, like three, uh, spatial hypersurface, then the future evolution of it is going to be uh, well-defined so long as the uh, boundary conditions at infinity are all zero. That is called Cauchy problem. Now, if you imagine that this velocity is changing as a function of time, then we would have something emerging from vacuum and we could emerge from vacuum in several different possible ways. And that basically is another way of saying that Cauchy problem is ill-defined. So uh, in fact, the uh, you can ask me why is that so that the time varying velocity leads to ill-defined Cauchy problem, but it's actually a problem. So, uh, and the way around that problem is to have velocity constant, or if you want to change the velocity to have the conditions at the boundary not equal to zero. So then it's not a Cauchy problem, it's a, it's a, it's a different problem. So, well, but suppose, okay, we're thinking about warp drives which are not self-accelerating, which have a constant velocity. Uh, so uh, a warp bubble looks like that. It's a it's a it's a region um, which uh, which has which is curved inside and which is limited by the stop head function. So outside of it, it's a flat space time. It's moving with some velocity v s to the right here in the picture. Uh, another point about the subluminal solutions I would like to point out is that the gravity in here is truncated. So the top head function makes the gravity fall off within some region, which is some number of times of the of the bubble size. Um, well. That means that, for example, one could put a solar mass and be 100 meters away from it and don't feel it and not feel its gravity, which is uh, which may be a little bit artificial. But in principle, well, that's just a feature. But I mean, maybe it's a bit of artificial feature. It's good to have it in mind. 
Yet another point is that, okay, suppose we are talking about subliminal solutions, they're moving, uh, well, this, this whole construction moves with slower than the speed of light, then uh, because it moves slower than the speed of light, we could also take an observer, which is a time-like observer, which is co-moving with the bubble. And then uh, from the point of view of that time-like observer, there is some region of the Minkowski space-time where in, inside something interesting is happening. And um, well, if you look at this metric, then we find that actually in that region inside the LQBR solution, the time goes uh, in a special way. So suppose I'm, um, I'm, I'm just a person, okay? And I have sent out an Alcubierre bubble in front of me. Then the time as it goes in the Alcubierre bubble in front of me is going to be going in the same way as it's going for me. And it is a bit artificial. So for example, if you take a bubble which moves at 0.99% of the speed of light, then the time inside there is going to be going in the same way as for me. So without any time dilation. So if I try to, well, accelerate and move along with the bubble, then for me, the time will be delayed compared to me before standing there. So in other words, if you think about an observer co-moving with the bubble given by the Alcubierre metric, then the time inside the Alcubierre metric is going to be going faster than the time for a co-moving observer for whom the time is delayed. So now let's, Think back for a second. So in the subluminal regime, what the warp drive metric does really is that, I mean, really what it's all about. So what is the effect of the, of the, of the metric actually? Uh, the two key features of the drive really is to, is to have the metric um, truncated and to have the time accelerated inside the bubble. That's all it does in the subliminal regime. So I mean, alternatively, I could just as well fly as a test-like observer, have the time delayed, but uh, instead I have a region in space-time where the time is accelerated and which, uh, where the gravity is uh, truncated. Um, and well, I would like just to, I mean, wonder, I mean, what is there any better way to travel at subliminal velocities? Uh, what could be done differently? What could be done better? Uh, there have been a few, modifications proposed in the literature, some, uh, some of them have been mentioned. Uh, there is a, a generalization of the Alcubierre solution, which is called Natario solution, uh, where in the key point of the metric really in this, uh, in this respect is to have general form of walls of the, of the bubble. So in other words, the, the walls which separate the region which is inside the bubble from the region which is outside of the bubble, uh, that's what the Natario solution is about. But that doesn't change the way the gravity is truncated. It doesn't change the way the time is accelerated. Um, there was a solution or proposed which is about expanding the space inside the, the bubble. It's called Van der Broek solution. The idea in there is that if you have a bubble, for example, it could look like you know one millimeter sized bubble from outside, but inside the space is expanded. So you could actually put an elephant into one millimeter sized bubble. And that's the idea of the Van der Broek solution. That's by really changing the, um, well, ch changing the metric of the, of the bubble. Uh, there'd been an idea which was about modifying the rate of time inside the bubble as well. So that was by low, for example, uh, by changing the lapse function as was discussed uh, earlier. Um, and really the question is, perhaps one could wonder about is that, you know, uh, the, 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 there is this uh, general uh, class of notario drives, uh, which includes the uh, Alcubierre drive and the uh, other, many other proposed metrics. And there've been a few uh, proposed ideas of how to maybe generalize that and sort of take somewhat more general form of the, of the, of the inner region of the bubble. So uh, that motivated us to think of a more general definition of a warp drive and really just ask what, what is this, uh, what, what is a warp drive? What makes a warp drive a warp drive basically? And uh, the, the overall picture of that is that if, um, well, perhaps a warp drive could be thought of as a region, which is somehow separated from the outside space time. The outside space time probably should be asymptotically flat and probably should be a vacuum space time. Um, and the, the region which is separated from that outside space time should probably be flat. So in other words, we want to be carrying an observer which doesn't feel any tidal forces. And then there can be anything in between. It can be any distribution of matter, positive or negative, just, just some kind of, it can be of any shape. Uh, and it just, uh, it's just a boundary between the uh, outside asymptotically flat region and the inside flat region. And uh, actually such a construction is actually quite handy for analyzing some properties of the, of the, of the warp drives. So 
Specifically, actually, there is a symmetry uh, present for Warbler space time. So if you take a Warbler space time, um, it's flying from left to right. Oh, I don't know if it's mirrored on your side, but anyways, it's flying from one side to another side. Uh, and the idea is that it doesn't really matter if you look at warp drive today here or tomorrow over there. So it's going to be the same thing, but we just shift a little bit in position. So in other words, there is a killing vector associated with the motion of the warp drive over warp drive in some direction. And uh, because warp drives, at least for, um, for, for existing constructions, have to have constant velocity, uh, that's a killing vector field. Uh, and uh, the idea is then if, that if, the, if you have the killing vector field, it basically is a vector field which uh, defines observers potentially, or at least it defines a um, class of transformations, which uh, which which basically are saying that the warp drive is not changing with time. So kind of in other words, we have kind of an idea of a, of, a, of a metric which is not changing with time, is propagating in some direction, is kind of like always the same in different locations. Um, and uh, one can use this Kelvin vector field to establish a global co-moving reference frame. So if if the Kelvin vector field, uh, which specifies the non-changedness of the warp drive, is time-like. Then one can put a time-like observer moving together with the Killing vector field. And then uh, for the time-like observer, one could uh, basically say that from the point of view of the time-like observer, for example, here inside or somewhere in the boundary or somewhere else, um, aligned with the Killing vector field, one could say that that time-like observer is at rest with respect to the bubble. So that's just a simple picture of how observers might be able to interact with the bubble. Um, Having a Killing vector field allows one to classify all types of warp drives into four classes. So one of the ideas, so one of the points is that, okay, suppose we have a, a class of symmetries of warp drives, that is to say uh, that one could have time like observers sitting inside the bubble and become moving with the bubble and be also outside of the bubble and become moving with the bubble. Uh, that would correspond to subluminal warp drives, which contain the not too much distorted space time inside. So the time like observers could be present inside and outside and be moving with the bubble. Uh, we might also have a situation when the bubble is superluminal, uh, but which, like in the Alcubierre metric, uh, allows the time-like observers to exist inside. So then the Killing vector inside is time-like, outside it's space-like. So there's no uh, physical observers which are co-moving with, with the superluminal bubble. Uh, likewise, one could also think of other types of metric. For example, one could have a subluminal uh, solution where in, for example, one uh, may not contain any time-like observers inside because, for example, the time-like observers cannot be addressed. It's like, for example, an analog of black hole space-time. Um, this, this analysis uh, leads to one simple conclusion, for example, is that if you take a solution which is, uh, which is superluminal, then for superluminal, for superluminal solution, and if the drive is truncated, in other words, if, uh, uh, if outside of the, uh, if outside of the, of the of the region where there is matter, the space time is not asymptotically flat, but just imper uh, just purely flat. So, in other words, that outside of this uh, construction metric is like there's no gravity, uh, but inside there is matter and gravity. Uh, that applies to the Alcubierre solution, but also to Eric's solution and to also a few other solutions. Uh, so, uh, if, if if that is the case, then the healing vector field for superluminal case has to be time-like inside. In other words, we want, we want to have an observer inside. It has to be space-like outside. In other words, we want to uh, not have observers outside. And the transition between the time-like and space-like will be happening inside the region where the matter is present. There will be a killing horizon uh, present in the, in the region where the matter is present. And it means just like Miguel was discussing in his talk in the beginning. So there will be some place uh, outside of the killing horizon wherein the matter has to be moving superluminally, or in other words, the matter has to be present in the region where the killing vector field is space-like, uh, which basically indicates that there is some kind of superluminal matter. And that actually is related to truncated warp drives, warp drives with this sharp boundary violating the dominant energy condition. Uh, and also please note that there has been recently discussion that there is uh, analogy condition violations and other energy condition violations uh, in the recent nice work by Jessica Santiago and others, uh, but that applies only to notario drives uh, as far as the paper goes. Uh, I'll just very quickly interrupt. Three minutes. Yep. Thank you. Three minutes. Perfect. Yep, very good. Uh, I'll just very quickly, very quickly introduce the idea of the spherical, spherical symmetrical uh, warp drives. So uh, one might think that the Alcubierre drive, for example, is spherically symmetrical, but uh, if you switch to the co-moving reference frame, it's not spherically symmetrical anymore, and it doesn't have a spherically symmetrical killing vector field. Uh, but one could think of a warp drive which is spherically symmetrical in the co-moving reference frame. And uh, the good the good thing about this construction is that if you think about such spherically symmetrical uh, warp drives in the co-moving reference frame, uh, then they are fully solvable. So in other words, we we have exact solution for uh, for spherically symmetric, you know, space-time general relativity. 
uh, and one can solve the Thoman Oppenheimer Volkov equations, which are originally devised for neutron stars, but one can apply that to a warp drive like metric because it's a spherical spherical configuration, but with just different boundary conditions. Uh, and the idea there is that, you know, if we, if we, for example, have a spherical symmetrical metric, we could have any stress energy tensor, positive or negative energy, and we can get the metric, or vice versa. We can take any metric we want, and we can get the stress energy tensor, which produces that metric. And uh, spherical symmetry is only possible for subliminal motions. Uh, so if you are subliminal, there's no spherical symmetry al allowed, so there's no uh, killing vector which corresponds to spherical symmetry. But for subliminal motions, we at least can solve the metric completely, and for example, construct solutions with positive uh, energy density, or for example, solutions which are uh, not violating energy conditions because they are so close to trivial solutions. And the key point in there is that uh, the positive energy solutions, they have to slow down the time inside the drive, and they also have to produce gravity, which falls off asymptotically outside of the drive. Um, one point, there is a diversity of other solutions. I will not go much into that. So in, in our paper, we provide a method for constructing other types of warp drive solutions wherein one in a general way can, for example, have a chosen rate of time inside the drives. One could have spinning inertial observers relative to other inertial observers. One can construct complex engineering metrics. I think the key point, the key message for that is just really try to think about the measurements of observers inside the drive and also outside the drive and try to relate them. Um, I will close with a brief outlook on the on the warp drive field. So, first of all, our message is uh, well. Here's this new general definition of warp drives. Really, uh, it, it actually well. I mean, it is in principle quite general for. I mean, so one just really should think about the uh, space time inside the bubble, and that one doesn't have to limit to any particular space times. Um, another message is that. It's, it's also interesting to think about subliminal regime as for superluminal regime, because in subliminal regime, one could get quite good insights into what happens about with, with the warp drives. Um, well, I guess that's, uh, well, like, apart from that, we have actually constructed a positive energy solution for the subliminal, uh, for subliminal warp drives. Um, in the outlook, I would just like to say about the field then. So uh, the, the point is that uh, right now, um, it's still, uh, we still don't have acceleration solutions. So we would like to, I mean, we'd like somebody to devise perhaps solutions which are explicitly accelerating, which do not, which, which are, which form a well-posed Cauchy problem and uh, uh, perhaps, uh, yeah, uh, perhaps that. Uh, another thing is that we, uh, it's, it's quite obvious but from these, 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 uh, these considerations that these, the, 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 the variety of Warp drives is very diverse. There's actually very many. There's a lot of metrics with very different properties, and uh, the all, all the properties of these metrics are still being explored very much. And uh, that's actually a very active field of research. And another point is that, uh, well, I think I think one important direction for generally for uh, for the warp drive research is to chart the physical solutions, wherein the physical solutions end, and where they, uh, I mean, what what, what what warp drives are possible within the physical uh, solution phys physicalness of uh, of the warp drives. Finally, I would like to point out it's a very active field. There have been uh, several papers just recently um, on the topic, and there's a very interesting debate going on among, among all the authors, and I very much foresee there's going to be very many interesting developments further in the future in the, in the topic, and uh, that's a very positive thing. Last but not least, just, uh, just to know that at least this project was done uh, within the uh, cohort of scientists called Applied Physics, uh, which uh, is also... Um, uh, an institution wherein we are welcoming uh, people to collaborate on the topic, and we have uh, positions open just on that. And uh, I would welcome you, invite you to check out uh, our website over here. Uh, and uh, thank you so much for your attention. Thank you, Alexei, very much. Um, we way over time, but one quick question, if there is, or comment. I would just like to ask one question, can I? Sure, uh, yeah, Alexei, I, I, I worry a bit that your definition might be too general because I get the feeling that maybe if you just have a shell of solid matter moving at some speed, it would fall into the, your definition of warp drive. And I, I don't feel that that's actually what a warp drive should be about. So is, is that true? I mean, if, if I just imagine I have a shell of a metallic shell, something spherical moving around, is that a warp drive from the point of view of your definition? Uh, yeah, we were, we were thinking about that quite a lot, uh, how to best present it to the community. But the idea is that, right, so I mean, uh, there's a continuous transition from very trivial solutions to very non-trivial solutions. So indeed, if you take a very, very, very simple shell, which like just one millimeter thick metallic shell, 
uh, it would formally be also a structure like this. So it would be matter and some area enclosed and so on. But if you keep on making that shell more and more massive, then at some point we will have such a mass in the shell that it would correspond to like some kind of black hole like properties. I mean, you could actually almost uh, have it inside its event horizon. So, um, I mean, in principle, one could say that we want to draw the line, for example, and say that, okay, that the warp drives are solutions wherein the metric is distorted by at least that much. Uh, that's a possibility. Uh, but another possibility is just to say that they form a continuous transition from very trivial classes to really very interesting classes. So, you know, either, either, way, is, uh, either way is legit, I would say. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Okay. So thank you again, Alexei. Uh, let's move on to the, the next speaker, uh, Os, um, Osvaldo. So please share your screen. Osvaldo will be speaking about perfect uh, fluid warp drive solutions within Lambda, with Lambda days. So Osvaldo, please go ahead. Sure. Uh, can you all see my screen? Yes. Okay. Uh, good morning, uh, Fris. I, like, I hope you are all well in these enduring pandemic times. And I'd like to thank the invitation to be part of such prestigious meeting with well-known researchers from all around the globe. I'll be talking about my, uh, my work. Uh, I, uh, my PhD advisors and I have four, four articles published. And this particular work is about the cosmological constant and perfect fluid warp drive solutions. Well, uh, First, our motivation for this work was that the original warp drive metric was proposed and there was no, uh, well, uh, no solution for the warp drive. And also the hypothesis that it required uh, negative energy densities and subsequently negative matter densities for, for, for it to be possible. Uh, also the motivation that uh, a lot of researchers uh, think that the warp drive is possible and they worked on the geometry and linearized conditions and on other tweaks on the warp drive metric to find uh, this kind of possibility. Uh, in summary, the warp drive uh, was proposed by Miguel Cubier in 1994 and he chose this specific metric, a uh, warp drive metric, this a specific geometry and with the aid of the three plus one formalism and uh, uh, he made uh, a specific choice of parameters and he used the shift vector in, a, in, a, in one direction in a specific direction in a space-time coordinate and he chose this specific shape, uh, shape function for the warp bubble uh, shape. Uh, uh, in summary, the space-time foliation, the three plus one formalism uh, uses space-time foliation and the shift vector relates the spatial coordinates between the foliated hypersurfaces and the lapse function is the proper time interval between consecutive hypersurfaces. Uh, the, sh the shape the shape of the warp bubble uh, is uh, given by the, the shape function and is proportional to the derivative of the, fun the shape function. Now, uh, one of the motivations of our work was th this relation here on this slide. Uh, we made uh, a gauge like proposing this, this term on the brackets it was equal to zero. So the, uh, in a specific region of the space time, maybe the energy conditions uh, could not be violated. And this will be discussed later on, on further slides. In our work, we propose a, a simple method to investigate the warp drive by trying to solve the Einstein equations and in proposing simple energy momentum distribu distributions. Uh, first, in our first article, we used the dust energy momentum tensor, and in our second article, uh, we used the perfect fluid, and we, we tried this new approach with a, a new kind of parameterized fluid that can be physically interpreted as 
uh, anisotropic fluid with heat flux. And in our third article, we, we tried the Charlie dust. Well, for, for this work that I am presenting here, we try to tweak the geometry of the warp drive by inserting the cosmological constant in Einstein equations. So in the original warp drive, uh, this term is uh, neg negative everywhere, but with the insertion of the cosmological constant, uh, we can have the opportunity to have a positive energy density. Here we tackle the, uh, the Einstein equations in a traditional way. We, we first uh, inserted um, matter energy distribution and try to solve the Einstein equations with the warp drive geometry. And we found uh, an exciting solution that connects the warp drive with shock waves uh, by the, via the Burgers equation. Uh, I find this really exciting because it shows uh, how the Einstein equations can be represented by such a well-known partially partial differential equation uh, that dictates the dynamics of a, a warp bubble like a shock wave in vacuum solutions. And here we also find another set of solutions that connects the cosmological constants with the matter density and the static pressure of the fluid. And uh, it is very exciting also that uh, there exists, uh, there exists a state equation that could connect all the parameters that we chose for our matter energy distribution. Well, uh, we found four sets of solutions. Two of them are very similar, like we, you can see in the previous slide. The shift vector depends on, uh, on, on the only two uh, space-time coordinates, the time coordinate, and the second uh, space coordinate in this solution. And in, in these other solutions, is it is very similar, but the, the shift vector depends only on the time coordinate and the, the third uh, space coordinate, space-time coordinate. And we also find that uh, starting with this particular case, we, all, we also reach the Burgers equation as a solution for the Einstein equations and, and, and in the vacuum solutions. Well, in conclusion, we found that the warp drive as the geometry con is connected to shock waves via Burgers equation, and it is vacuum solutions for the Einstein equations. And the original warp drive metric satisfies the weak and, uh, and dominant energy conditions in a specific region of space-time, which is the vacuum solutions that we found connecting it to the Burgess equation. The warp drive requirements of negative energy densities and negative matter density can be weakened with a convenient, convenient choice of energy momentum tensor with enough, enough parameters as to balance the fact that the energy density component is, uh, is non-positive. So I conclude this presentation uh, with the commentary that it is very interesting that vacuum solutions connect the warp drive with shock waves via the Burgess equation. Uh, uh, via a traditional way of approaching the Einstein equation solutions. Uh, and, and I conclude my presentation, if you want to ask some questions. Thank you, uh, Oswaldo, for the talk. So, uh, as before, one quick question, because we, we're still ahead of time, we're still uh, over time, in fact. So, one quick question. Oh, Matt? Um, <clears throat> yes, um, you mentioned uh, Burge's equation is associated with a vacuum solution. And I got a little worried when I saw that because typically vacuum solutions in GR 
I uh, mean, Minkowski space. So I suggest you take Burge's equation, feed it back into the Riemann tensor. And I was getting a Riemann tensor of zero, which suggests to me that the shock wave you were finding was only a shock wave in your coordinate system, that it was not actually a physical shock wave of any sense. If the, if the Riemann tensor is zero, you're just doing Minkowski space in odd coordinates. So I, I think there's something there that needs to be uh, carefully looked at. Sure, yes. Uh, actually, I did this math uh, after the, we published our article and the Riemann tensor is actually new. Uh, but we, we tried an approach, a physical approach by proposing the dust, ener the dust energy momentum tensor. Uh, and we found we reach the condition for the energy condition to be valid, that the merit distribution should be new, and we arrive at the Burgers equation. But you're right, the Riemann tensor is actually new. Okay. But I, okay. I, I will investigate this further. Uh, if, it, if, if it is not just some coordinate question. Uh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, so that's my concern that it might just be everything might be a coordinate artifact. But I think we should move on because I see Francisco looking at us. And <laughs> <laughs> okay. I, I'm sorry about this. We really have to move on. It's been a fantastic session. Uh, we can continue um, with the chat or somehow. Uh, but uh, I'll pass now the chat to Diego. And uh, Diego, so please go ahead. Thank you very much oh. for the session. Thanks, Francisco. Okay, so our next speaker is Juan Carlos de Laguila Rodriguez. Uh, so, Juan Carlos, can you start your, your video? Yes, hello. One second, please. Okay, we can see the slides now. I can hear you well. Okay. Now it should be fine. Okay, so please do a start. Yes, thank you. Well, good day to everybody. Uh, my name is Juan Carlos del Aguila. I would like to thank the organizers for giving me this opportunity to present my work here. And it is called Gravitational Perturbations in the Newman Penrose Formalism with Applications to Wormholes. I will begin by giving a very brief introduction of the Newman Penrose Formalism. And after that, I will describe the, the gravitational perturbations uh, within this tetrad formalism. I will uh, focus in spherically symmetric spacetimes for which we will derive a master equation. Later on, this master equation will be applied to the Morris Storm wormholes. And at the end, I will give some conclusions. Now, the Neumann Penrose formalism is an alternative description of pseudo Riemannian geometry. Here I, sh I show all the typical elements of, of so the Riemannian geometry and with the, the Newman Penrose counterparts. As you can see, we have uh, one can may call it as a metric of the formalism. It possesses two tetrad indices. Uh, here the Latin indices will denote tetrad indices. And we need to introduce also a new tetrad in the space time. This new tetrad consists of two real vectors and one complex vector. Here a bar denotes complex conjugation. We will also uh, impose the, the following orthogonality property to the vectors of the new tetrad, which we can express uh, using this gamma metric. And it can also be seen explicitly here in the, in the form of the space-time metric in terms of the new tetrad. To each vector of this tetrad, there will be associated a, a differential operator. There will also uh, be the definition of the spin coefficients, which will be related to this calligraphic C quantity. And finally, we'll have two uh, curvature quantities, the, this phi a, phi a B and the bias colors. Uh, you can see their, their definitions here in, at the uh, right side of, of the slide. These are the 12 complex spin coefficients. They are denoted by Greek letters. And also, uh, 
a very important pro, uh, component of this formalism are the Ricci, the so-called Ricci identities. I show some examples here. There are a total of 18 identities, so I won't, I won't be showing them all. I won't fill your, your screen with equations. But you can understand them as, as the definition of these curvature quantities in terms of skin, spin coefficients and the, the operators. Now, a remarkable result from several years ago is uh, the very well-known Tolkowski master equation for perturbations of the curve metric. He, he utilized this uh, Newman Penrose formalism. However, the curve metric is a vacuum, a type B vacuum spacetime. So uh, our objective here is uh, to apply this formalism to, to perturbations in wormholes. To do perturbation theory within this formalism, we need to perturb the vectors of the null tetrad. Here, uh, a tilde over uh, any given quantity will indicate that it is a background quantity, while a hat uh, indicates it is a perturbation quantity. The perturbation terms can now be expanded in terms of the of these matrices, sigma and omega. These matrices will contain all the information of the perturbation. And evidently, as a result of modifying the, the null tetrad, the quantities of the formalism will also change. For instance, I here show some spin coefficients, operators, and bile scalars. As you may expect, uh, there is freedom when, when choosing this null perturbed tetrad. First, we have these null rotations of the tetrad, which basically are Lorentz transformations that leave the orthogonality properties invariant. And they are represented here with uh, as an uh, anti-symmetrical term of the omega matrix. And we can also do gauge transformations. Now, due to time restrictions, I won't be able to, do, to give the full details here, but I will outline some steps to, to obtain perturbed field equations. First, we need to compute the perturbation terms of the modified spin coefficients. Once we have these terms, we can insert them in linearized rich identities and obtain perturbed quantities phi a, b. And then we can express components of the Ricci tensor in terms of, the, of these curvature quantities. The spin coefficients change as, as this equation. Uh, again, I won't give the full derivation here, but this is a, this is a way of obtaining the, the perturbed term. As I said, I will focus on spherically symmetric space times, which admit this, uh, this line element without loss of generality. An orthonormal frame in this space time is given by these x vectors. And we can construct a null tetrad taking linear combinations of, of the x vectors. I must point out here that this null tetrad is not uniquely defined. Here I am choosing a, a tetrad in which the L and M vectors lie in the subspace spanned by, span by killing vectors. I will consider this perturbation term. It represents a, a perturbation of odd parity in the regular gauge. And it is often also called as an axial perturbation. These uh, H0 and H1 functions will be independent of the azimuthal angle due to the background symmetry of the spacetime. We can then employ the, the background, tetraun, background tetrad as a basis to express the H menu uh, form of the of the perturbation term. I, I will also uh, per change slightly the notation. I will, for simplicity, drop the, the tilde of the background quantities. So any quantity you see from this point forward that do, do not have a hat will uh, reference the, the perturb, I mean, the, the background space time. So following the steps I, I described earlier, we can arrive to these non-vanishing components of the projection of the orthonormal frame into the Ricci tensor. These are three. However, uh, this, this just describes one side of the perturb field equations. The other side is naturally given by the physical uh, properties of the gravitational source. So let us consider background field equations of, of this type where S menu and S uh, contain the, the physical properties of, of a gravitational source. 
I will assume that the physical parameters of the source are not perturbed. So the only term that will yield a perturbation will be this, this second one. And finally, I can uh, present the, the set of equations that we need to solve. I won't go over all the details, of course, but one can show that this is a solution to, to the system of equations I presented. Only if the s -mu tensor admit this diagonal structure where C is an inter integration constant. Now, something uh, important to, to point out here is that um, a lot of physically relevant space times admit this, this form. Uh, obviously, vacuum, that's a trivial example, but one can also think of scalar field solutions, which uh, a lot of wormholes uh, are supported by phantom scalar fields, so we can apply all of these results to them. Perfect fluid might be another example also. Now I, I will change the uh, perturbation function F1 to a Q and arrive to the final form of our master equation, which contains several terms. And the, the significance of these various terms depend on the coordinates they, they, uh, they have. One can see here the explicit ex expressions of the screen coefficients and operators. We pro propose a typical ansatz, a separable ansatz, and find that the angular term of the master equation is this second order differential equation which has uh, a simple solution in terms of the very well-known Lejean polynomials. But first, uh, we must analyze what uh, the physical regularity of the perturbation. For this purpose, the, the bile scalars are a, a very helpful tool. This is due because uh, Newman and Penrose give a so-called building theorem that describes the asymptotic fall-off rates of the bile scalars. For instance, for the Psi 2 scalar, uh, they, it should uh, decay as uh, 1 over R, R cube at asymptotically null infinity. Uh, I here show the, the end result of the Psi, Psi 2 scalar computed using the linearized Ricci identities. Uh, sorry, Juan Carlos, two minutes left. Only two minutes. OK, I'm, yeah, I'm going to speak to, to skip this. Um, but I. The lowest multiple of gravitational rotation is the quadruple. This is the, the important conclusion here. So I will focus on the now Morris and Thorne wormholes, which have this line element. And in an autonomous frame, they have this uh, interpretation where rho is the energy density, tau radial tension, and P, P is the pressure. These are the geometrical properties that a wormhole must satisfy. I am going to assume that we are familiar with this. And uh, with the unfortunate conclusion that the no energy condition must be violated at least near the throat of the wormhole. This is the model we consider of uh, stress energy tensor. U here is uh, for the four velocity of the matter in a moving frame, and nu is a uh, vector pointing in the radial direction. We may compute the rich tensor from this tensor as well, and uh, find that it admits the form that we uh, previously studied. Hence, we can apply this master equation. We, uh, using the master equation, we can reduce the problem of gravitational perturbations to a Schrodinger-like operator with uh, an eigenvalue omega squared. I, I have assumed an, an harmonic per, uh, form of the uh, perturbation. And we have this effective potential in terms of the, of the air energy density and radial tension as well. Uh, as we saw, the null energy conditions are violated, and this means that rho, rho can become negative, which in turn, which can make uh, the potential negative as well. And this can be, this can lead to instabilities of the, of the wormhole. So moving on, I, I will focus on a class of metrics in which these term, terms vanish. We can prove that this, uh, this class of metrics indeed possess the geometry of a wormhole and arrive to a very simple expression of the potential, uh, of the effective potential, which has asymptotic solutions uh, involving the spherical Hankel functions. These uh, obviously represent uh, gravitational waves. <clears throat> 
And we can see from the, this expression of the potential that it is uh, strictly positive for all radial coordinate values. And because uh, the, this inequality of the imposed on the shape function, and also because L starts take values uh, starting from two and so on. We can conclude then that uh, because the, this uh, effective potential is positive everywhere, there are no linearly unstable vibrational modes generated by perturbations of odd parity for this class of wormholes. In this table, I show some examples. Maybe the most important one is a simple uh, Elise Bronikov wormhole. And sum up, we, we use the Neumann Penrose formalism to obtain a, a master equation to describe the behavior of odd parity gravitational perturbations. We applied, as I mentioned, this can be applied to wormholes supported by phantom scalar fields and other space times. Uh, include also more storm wormholes. I describe here uh, those who has the property for which is gravi gravitational source, uh, its energy density is equal to its radial pressure. And we found that it uh, were stable only to perturbations of what parity. So I, I think I'm going to end here. Thank you for your attention. And that will be all. Thank you, Juan Carlos, for your talk. Uh, so we have time for one question, if there is any in the audience. So if anyone wants, wants to make a question, just unmute your phone, microphone. Okay, so if there are no questions, so we, we move on to the next talk. Thanks, Juan Carlos, again for your talk. And then our next talk is by Paulami Dutaroy. So... Yes, I, I had a question. Ah, I have a question. very short okay. question. Good. Can I... Very short please question. Yeah, please go ahead. Okay. The question I had is the inner model of the wormhole and what you're working with is that were you able to come up to say with a stable negative energy condition to say at the throat of the wormhole or did you have a variation to say a negative energy at the throat of a wormhole? Uh, all right. Uh, yeah, uh, the, all of these wormholes uh, violate the, the energy conditions because... Uh, yes, they, I they, saw that. Uh, yeah, I, I didn't get the, the, the question then. Could you repeat, please? Well, you say all of them violate that condition then. Yes, yes. Okay, well, you answered my question. Yeah, I, I, I didn't quite get it. So can you please repeat it? Sorry. What I'm asking you is for a wormhole that normally is assumed you have a negative energy and the throat. All right? Yes, yes. And what I'm asking you is you said there are no linearly unstable vibrational modes generated by perturbations, odd parity in this class of wormholes. I said no linearly unstable. Does that mean in effect, which is you're going to have a, a so-called constant to say uh, behavior of energy in the throat of the wormhole, or is that an inappropriate question? I, I, I'm sorry, I, I didn't understand the, the... Okay, well, if you don't understand, don't worry about it. I don't want yeah. to take people's time. Yeah, yes. Don't worry about it. It's not important. All right. Thank okay, you very yeah. much for your talk. Okay, thanks, thanks for the question. And thanks, Juan Carlos, for your, again, for your talk. So we move to, to the next uh, speaker. Uh, so, but it seems that the, the speaker now is off. Ah, okay. Okay. So yeah, thanks, for me. Yeah, we can you can see your screen and hear you well. So please go oh, ahead. Okay. As you, as you wish. Okay, so let me just keep it in the screen. Okay, perfect. So first, uh, hi everyone. I'm Bolumi Dattaroy, and I would uh, begin by thanking the organizers for giving me this opportunity to present my work on uh, geometry, matter, quasi normal modes, and echoes. Uh, which I will be discussing for a particular family of ultrastatic wormholes. So this work was done in collaboration with Anish and Professor Shyam Kaur in IIT Kharagpur, India. So this is how I plan to proceed. So first I would introduce the wormhole family that we work on mm -hmm. and see the constituent matter and the energy conditions. Then we will see the stability analysis by studying the propagation of a massless scalar wave in this background wormhole. And finally, we will briefly touch upon the uh, stability analysis under actual gravitational perturbation. 
So without any further ado, let us begin. So this is the wormhole metric that we uh, work on. So this is a two parameter family of Lorentzian wormhole. And this was created as kind of a generalization to the well-known ellis bronikov wormhole. So in this 1994 paper. So why are we calling this as a generalization will become more apparent as we go on. So the metric has a form like this, where you can see that the GTT component is minus one and the shape function of the one hole has a form like this, where R is my radial coordinate and the relation between the radial and the tortoise coordinate, which we denote here as L is something like this. So you can see that there are two uh, uh, parameters of our one hole. So the first is the throat radius B naught and the other one is the parameter N. So we are assuming this n to take only even values and uh, this n basically controls the geometry of the one hole. So these two parameters are manifesting themselves in the metric using uh, the shape function and the relation between the R and L. And in the plot at the very uh, uh, corner of the slide, you can see the smooth variation of R of L uh, for different values of n. So here basically in, uh, by changing in, I'm basically changing the geometry of the one hole. So now if we take a look at the embedding diagram, we see that for n equal to two case, we get the most simplest example of ellis bronikov one hole. And it has a very simple form of metric like this. But if we change the value of n say to n equal to four or six, then we see that the geometry is indeed very different from the ellis bronikov case. So we can say that these other n values, say, which are not equal to two, can be thought as kind of a generalization to the ellis bronikov wormhole geometry. And so by simply plugging in different parameters in the wormhole metric, we get distinct different geometries. So now we will take a look at the matter and the energy conditions. So here we should see that rho, tau, and p are basically the components of the energy momentum tensor. And here X is nothing but just the tortoise coordinate L. So you can see that we have written everything in, as a sum of two quantities. So the first quantity here is basically having an index phi and it denotes the contribution that comes from the phantom scalar field. And the second quantity that we have that has an index E is basically some extra matter term that we have for the N greater than two one hole geometry. So the phantom scalar field is responsible for producing the one hole, which is the ellis bronikov case, that is n equal to two. But this field alone cannot produce the n greater than two geometries. And that is why we require the extra matter term that we have over here. So we know that the energy condition is violated by the phantom scalar field. But can we make any comment like that for the extra matter term that we have? So before we go into that, we will take a look in what happens to the total energy momentum tensor components. That is here, the plots show the variation of rho, rho plus tau and rho plus p as a function of L. And you can see that indeed the energy condition is violated, at least the weak energy condition is violated for specific values of L. So now we take a look at the extra matter term that we have for the n greater than two geometry. So for that, we will be calculating the averaged null energy condition, which goes uh, something like this. That is, we need to calculate this integral. And if this integral has a value greater than or equal to zero, then we say that the ANEC condition is indeed satisfied. And we will be doing this only for the extra matter term that we have for the n greater than two geometries. So you can see that uh, it uh, is just coming as a function of n, where n is our metric parameter. And for all the geometries, that is for all possible values of n, we get a positive value of IP. So indeed, we see that the average null energy condition is satisfied by all the uh, geometries, all the n greater than two geometries. So what does this mean? So we ask is what role this ANEC plays uh, or the ANEC satisfying matter plays for the n greater than two geometries. So the first thing is that the violation of energy condition does not occur at the throat. So what this means is that here L equal to zero is the position of the throat of the one hole geometry. And here you can see that the violation is not happening because these quantities are either zero or positive, but the violation is occurring a bit away from the throat. So this is uh, because of the presence of the uh, ANEC satisfying matter. 
and the other interesting thing is that the clearing out occurs a bit away from the throat and this produces what we call as the long necked one hole geometry so here you can see that a equal to 2 that is the ellis bronikov case has a phantom scalar field and the clearing out happens just from the throat but for any other n value say n equal to 10 you can see that clearing out is happening a bit away from the throat and this gives us a long neck structure of the one hole for any n greater than 2 geometries so this is a consequence of a is a satisfying matter for n greater than 2 geometries so now finally we come to the stability analysis where we uh, study the propagation of uh, scalar waves that is we simply solve the massless klein gordon equation uh, for a massless scalar field and we arrive at a master uh, wave equation of a schrodinger like form like this and you can see sorry so you can see that the effective potential we get here is a function of the throat radius the total is coordinate l n is the metric parameter that we have and m here we are denoting the angular momentum uh, number so if we plot it we see that only for the n equal to 2 that is the ellis bronikov case we get a single barrier but for all other values of n that is for all n greater than 2 geometries we are getting a double peak potential so as we keep on increasing the value of n we see that the potential peaks uh, somehow resemble uh, each other and it becomes very hard to distinguish them now if we increase the angular momentum number that is m so here m is 1 now if we take m equal to 10 then we see that apparently it may look that the potential is a single barrier but if we zoom in we see that indeed the double barrier peak is present but the, the height of the peak has decreased significantly so for all n greater than 2 geometries we conclude that the double barrier effective potential peak is present now if we uh, want to comment on the stability of the space time then we can uh, do the time domain evolution of uh, say a initial gaussian pulse so the initial conditions we have used something like this and the integration is done in null coordinates and we see that over time for two different geometries we have shown for n equal to 4 and n equal to 6 geometries we see that indeed the a uh, distinct qnm ringing structure is present and the signal goes on decaying with time indicating the stability of the one hole geometries so now we want to ask a question that whether we can distinguish the different shapes by shapes i mean the geometry of the one holes by simply the studying the quasi normal modes of the corresponding one hole so this plot you can see is a variation of the real part of the qnm frequency with the imaginary part for different n values so for different geometries i have used different colors to plot the different qnm values and each point on the plot basically denotes a particular angular momentum number so you can see that for small n values say like n equal to 2 4 6 and 8 you can distinguish the geometries very easily from the poisson normal modes because they are quite apart from each other and as you go on increasing the value of n they become very close to each other and it becomes very hard to distinguish them this basically happens because of the very similar effective potential for higher n values so now what we uh, go on further is to study the gravitational wave echoes so since we have a double barrier potential we will have uh, multiple reflections between these two peaks and there will be gravitational wave echoes but for this uh, n equal to 4 geometry we don't see any echoes on the time domain plot this is because the echoes are indeed present but they are diffused so much because of the huge backscattering occurring from the white peaks of the potential that we don't see these echoes on the time domain plot but if we were to take uh, n equal to 2600 geometry that is also a variable gordon pulse geometry there the effective potential has a very narrow peak and that is why we can see distinct echo pattern on the uh, a time domain profile and so we can conclude that if echoes are observed in the time domain spectrum then the corresponding geometry will belong to a large n one so now we come to the last part where we do a stability analysis under so we can interrupt action. you is two, two minutes left okay yes yes i am uh, yeah i will wrap up so under axial gravitational perturbation so this is currently an ongoing work so we have obtained the regie filler or the master uh, perturbation equation uh, for our one hole geometry and uh, if we plug in the values of the shape function we get a form of the effective potential something like this 
So now if we plot the effective potential, we see some very interesting features. So first is the n equal to two and four case where we see that the effective potential is indeed a single value. So this is quite distinctly different from the scalar uh, wave propagation case where the single barrier was shown only by the n equal to two case. But here for all angular momentum values, we will indeed have single barrier for both n equal to two and four geometries. So then if we uh, go to larger values of n, sorry, uh, say n equal to six, eight and 10, we see an even more interesting feature where for small m values, we see a triple barrier potential. But if we increase the value of m, those barriers merge to a single barrier. Now, finally, we can similarly do a stability analysis using time domain profiles, and we see that the uh, plots uh, decay, indicating a stable bond hole geometry under axial gravitational perturbation. So in conclusion, I will uh, discuss that we have seen the stability of our wormhole under scalar perturbations. We have uh, used the scalar quasi-normal modes for distinguishing the small in geometries, but for identifying large in geometries, we needed the help of the echoes. And uh, the, finally, the wormholes were stable under actual gravitational perturbation. So I want to end with the questions like, how well can our wormhole geometry mimic a black hole? Or and if the answer to this question is yes, then we can think that they can also be a possible template for black hole mimickers in gravitational field studies. Okay, so this is where I would stop. Thank you. Thanks, Paulami, for your talk. Uh, are there any questions uh, from the audience? We have a couple of minutes. Questions? Please, if anyone has a question, this is the time to make it. I have one short question. You said, when you say, how well can they mimic a black hole? When you say, how well do they mimic? What do you mean by how well can they mimic? So uh, by this, I'm trying to study the ring down behavior. So a ring down behavior of a black hole will have the QNMs and uh, the damped behavior. So I'm trying to see that whether my black, uh, one hole geometries can uh, do a very similar behavior to that of a black hole. Then in a real gravitational wave scenario, then there might be a possibility that the signal that we are observing might be a, that of a, a black hole mimicker and not from an actual black hole. Thank you. Any further questions? Okay, if not, thanks Paulami again for your talk. And we move on to our next speaker, who is uh, Arol, well, uh, Polami, if you can stop yeah, uh, yeah, sharing yeah. The, 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 okay, thanks. So Aroldo, please uh, share your um, share your slides with us. Yes. <clears throat> okay, we are listening to you. Now we are seeing your slides. Okay, is it in full screen? Yeah, it's in full screen. So please go okay. ahead. So let me track the time. So uh, I'm going to present this, this work, Scale Absorption and Black Holes versus Wormholes, which was done by me in collaboration with Carolina Benoni and Luis Crispino from Federal University of Pará. You can see further uh, details in this Physical Review D or in this archive. So this is the, uh, the basic outline of my presentation. Uh, so wormholes are a solution that connects two asymptotically flat regions by a throat. And uh, the absorption of scalar fields by black hole has have been uh, extensively analyzed in the literature. However, few results for the, for the absorption of scalar fields in wormhole space times are known. So our, our purpose here is to investigate the absorption of scalar field in a geometry proposed recently by by uh, Matt Visser and, and Alexis Simpson, which are in this Zoom meeting, which interpolates between a Schwarzschild black hole, a regular black hole, and a wormhole spacetime. So with this geometry, we can compare the difference between the absorption of black holes and wormholes. So as I mentioned before, this is the geometry proposed by them, uh, which we, we call here simpson visser geometry. So this interpolates for, for A equals to zero, we have a Schwarzschild black hole. For A between zero and two M, we have a regular black hole. And for A greater than two M, we have this uh, 
wormhole geometry. Uh, in, the, in the high frequency regime, the absorption cross section of the scalar field is, is well described by no geodesics. So we investigate no geodesics with this following Lagrangian here, which is given by equation three. So um, the dots denotes uh, differentiation with respect to the affine parameter along the no geodesics. And since this Lagrangian does not depend on the time coordinate on the end on the phi coordinate, we have two conservative quantities, E and L, which are the energy and angular momentum of the photon. And by substituting equation four and five in equation three, we can find this very uh, simple radio equation for the no geodesics, where VGO here is the scattering potential for the is the effective potential for no geodesics. So here in figure one, I showed the effective potential for the black hole case for different values of A. And here I showed the, the effective potential for the wormhole case where we can notice uh, the difference that we have here a potential well for, no for the wormhole case and this double, double peaks here. The absorption cross-section of the, the massless scalar fields uh, tends to the capture cross-section in the high frequency regime. So it's basically the area of the shadow where this BC here is the critical impact parameter. So we can find this critical impact parameter uh, from equation nine and 10. Uh, so we can we, we find the, the radio coordinates of the, of the unstable sequel of photon orbits, which is given here by equation 11. So it depends on the on the a coordinate on the on the a parameter, and uh, associated with these two solutions, with these three solutions here, we have these two possible values for the critical impact parameter given by equation twelve and thirteen. Consequently, the geometric cross section uh, is given by is summarized here in equation fourteen. So if A is between, is between zero and three M, we have this scattering cross section 25 pi M squared, which you may recognize to be equal to the Schwarzschild one, and it's the independent of the A value. And for A greater than three M, we have this uh, capture cross section, which is, depends on the A. <clears throat> now let's move on to the, part, to the, to the analysis of the massless scalar field. So the massless scalar field is described by the massless clay gordon equation here, uh, which can be rewritten as equation 16. And since the space time is spherically symmetric, we can decompose this scalar field as product of functions and product of a product of a radial function. The scalar is spherical harmonics and this uh, exponential here where omega is the frequency, frequency of the scalar field. So if we substitute equation 17 and equation 16 and use the well-known properties of the spherical harmonics, we may find this ordinary differential equation for the radial part of the field, where F here is this function given by an equation 19. And VF is the scattering um, effective potential for the scalar field. Here I show the, the effective potential for the massless scalar field for the black hole case for different values of L, which are the total angular momentum of the wave, of the scale of wave, and for different values of A. Where we note here, uh, in the black hole case, we have a single uh, potential barrier. While in the wormhole case, we have two peaks in the, in the potential, in the affected potential, and we also have this, this potential well here for some values of A. And for A grid equal or greater than 4M, this potential well disappears, as we can see here in the green, in, the, in these green lines here. So this is going to have important consequences in the absorption cross section. So we can write the this radio equation here in the in the tortoise coordinate. And we have a, a Schrodinger-like equation. And now we want to solve this radio equation with the appropriate boundary conditions, which are the conditions for the absorption problem. And for the black hole case, we have equation 22, which is basically at the spatial infinity uh, an incident wave. 
plus a reflected wave. And at the event horizon, we have these, these transmitted waves. For the wormhole case in the spatial infinity plus, the plus spatial infinity, we have basically the same result. The difference now is, is that there is no, no event horizon anymore. So here we define the absorbed wave as the waves that, that uh, cross the throat of the wormhole. <clears throat> then the total absorption cross-section is given by equation 24, where sigma L here are the, the partial waves, are the, uh, is the partial absorption cross-section. And it's related to the, to, this, to the square of the transmission coefficient. Now uh, we present a selection of our numerical results first for the, for the for the black hole case. So here I show the total absorption cross section of massless scalar waves for for the black hole case. I show the Schwarzschild the Schwarzschild result, and I also show um, the the total absorption cross section for different values of a in the black hole range of population. So. In the high frequency regime, we notice that the total absorption cross section oscillates around the, the geometric capture cross section, which is the same uh, for, for all values of A. And in the low frequency regime here in this region, the, the total absorption cross section tends to the same value. This value is equal to the area of the event horizon. And this is a, we a, a well known result for the absorption cross section of scalar waves. That is, the, in the low frequency regime, the, the total absorption cross section is equal to the area of the event horizon. And in between the, the, the low and the high frequency regime, we have this oscillatory pattern. And as we increase A, these, these peaks here, these peaks of the total absorption cross section increases. <clears throat> now I present uh, a selection of our numerical results for the one whole case. So here I show the total absorption cross sections of massless scalar waves for the wormhole with A equals to 2.1 M. And we, know, we may notice that this is very different from the, from the black hole case. The, the, the difference arises due to this, uh, these peaks here in the total in the absorption cross section, which are called resonant peaks. So such resonant peaks, they arise due to the, the presence of uh, trapped modes in the, in the potential well. And such trapped modes generate these this, this resonant peaks here in the total absorption cross section. And here below I put uh, what is something like an absorption spectrum of, of, of wormholes. Uh, in this figure here, I show the total absorption cross section for uh, other values of the parameter A. So for A equals to 2.5 M, it's a wormhole geometry. So we have our we have here some peaks, but it, it gets regular as we increase the value of the of A. So for A equals to 4 M, the total absorption cross section is regular. So this so, so had all two minutes left. Yes. Okay. So um, this can be explained by the fact that as we increase the value of the of a, the potential well for the the potential well for the for the scalar field uh, disappears. So we notice this fact here, since the the total absorption cross section is now regular, do not does not present any resonant peak. <clears throat> so uh, we computed in this work. We computed the absorption cross section of scalar waves in a space time that interpolates between a Schwarzschild black hole, a regular black hole, and a wormhole space time. We used the partial wave approach to, to compute the total absorption cross section of, of black hole and wormholes in this geometry. And we have shown that the black hole case can be very distinctive to the wormhole case. This, this, this distinction in the total absorption cross section arises due to the presence of the presence of resonant peaks in the total absorption cross section. So um, we have an absorption spectrum of wormholes very distinctive from the black hole case. 
and such resonant peaks they are related to trapped moles around the around the wormhole throat. So uh, here my acknowledgments are for COPS and CNPQ, which are the sponsor agencies in Brazil. And thank you for your attention. Thanks, Haroldo, for your presentation. Uh, are there any questions in the audience? Yeah, Alex, please go ahead. Uh, thanks for that, Diego, and thanks for your talk, Haroldo. Um, I was just curious, near the start of your talk, you mentioned that very little analysis has been done of the scalar absorption of wormholes. And I was wondering uh, whether in your lit review, if you came across similar phenomena in the past literature, or whether that just hasn't been done at all. Uh, so, sorry, uh, let, let me put my earphone so I think I can hear you, hear you better. Just, okay, just no worries. Me. So I think I, I can hear you better now. Okay, th thanks, Haroldo. So I was curious, at the start of your talk, you mentioned that the analysis of the scalar wave absorption of wormholes um, is, is in its infancy, or it hasn't been done much. So I was wondering to what extent the resonant peaks have been seen in the literature before, or whether that's a, a truly new phenomena that's unique to this space-time. Um, it's not a, a, a new feature. I, re I remember that, that I, I have read only one paper with this, with similar results, but it was uh, it was a different type of geometry. It was right. uh, I think it was black hole remnants, so it was not exactly wormholes in the sense that I think so. It was not wormholes in the sense of uh, of Morris and Horn paper. Right, right. Okay, well that, that's quite interesting. Mm. So we have time for another question. Okay, another question. Okay, so if not, thanks again, Haroldo, for your nice presentation. Uh, we move on to the next speaker, who is uh, Eleni Alexandra Contou. So if you are hearing me, uh, please share your screen with us. Okay, yeah, I can hear you. Okay, uh, okay. Yeah, we see your slides now. Uh, can you see my slides? Yeah, okay, please oh, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, thank you, the organizers, for uh, having me speak in this conference. So today I'm going to talk about null quantum energy inequalities uh, with an application singularity theorems for evaporating black holes. So this is mainly based uh, on this uh, paper we put on archive a few months ago and some very recent work. So energy conditions are point-wide restrictions on the stress energy tensure. And the energy condition we're interested in here is the null energy condition, the NEC which tells us that uh, the stress energy tensor contracted with two null vectors uh, cannot be negative. Geometric form is achieved using the Einstein equation, and it tells us that the Ricci contracted with two null vectors um, has to be non-negative. Uh, unfortunately, the null energy condition as all point-wise energy conditions are violated by quantum fields. So in quantum field theory, we have to use uh, weaker restrictions, and uh, namely the quantum energy inequalities, which are restrictions on magnitude, on the magnitude and duration of any negative energy density in the context of the quantum field theory. Uh, so we can see the analogous of uh, the NEC in, uh, in quantum field theory is a time-like average of the null energy density. So we have uh, the null energy, the, we take the renormalized expectation value of that quantity, and we smear it over a, a portion of a time like geodesic. And then we need to have some uh, negative values. So the bound depends on this smearing function F that we have here. Now, you might wonder why I smeared over a time-like portion of a geodesic and not a null geodesic, which might be more natural. So can we have the same quantum energy inequality over a null geodesic? Uh, the answer is no, we cannot have that, at least not immediately, because there's a counterexample to bounds of that of that short. Uh, this counterexample was proven by Fischer and Raumann, and they consider a particular state. We only need one state to show that this is violated for the bound to not hold. So they considered a, a sequence of vacuum plus two particle states. They allowed the three momenta of the excited modes to be unbounded and became more and more parallel to the special part of the null vector and they showed that the bound diverges. So we can't in general have a bound like that. 
Now, a recent idea is that in quantum field theory, there are often ultraviolet cutoffs that restrict the three momenta. So the problem in the previous example is the three momenta that became unbounded. So uh, the usual law in quantum field theory tells us that the G Newton is less than or equal to uh, this ultraviolet cutoff square over the number of quantum fields that we have. So imposing this ultraviolet cutoff leads to uh, this bound, which is the, called the smear null energy condition or uh, SNEC. So here we have uh, the normalized null energy averaged over null geodesic, and the bound depends on that ultraviolet cutoff, which is inside uh, the G Newton. Now, B here is an undefined number because this conjecture is expected to hold for, a, a, for a, at least approximately for a variety of field theories, but it has not been proven. What has been proven in our recent work is a derivation for free fields on Minkowski spacetime. Unfortunately, the proofs that we use cannot be extended to uh, curved spacetimes or non free uh, field theories. And uh, the bound also diverges at the limit of taking this uh, UV cutoff to zero. So recently, we have discussed a more a, a better bound. So the idea here is to instead of smearing in one null direction, which the bound diverges, to smear in both null directions. So here are the plus and minus directions. So here the bound depends on uh, two smearing functions, which are not necessarily the same. And uh, so it has two portions of the bound, one for each null direction. Now, the advantage of this bound is that it's actually been proven from a general quantum energy inequality and can be directly generalized for curved spacetimes. So it's a better bound in that sense. Also, the smearing can be controlled. There is no uh, ultraviolet cutoff that depends on the theory that we have imposed there. However, we, are, we don't know yet how uh, to use this bound in application, for example, for singularity theorems that I'm going to talk about. So for the rest of the talk, I'm going to focus on SNAC and how we can apply that to singularity theorems. At the end, I might make some comments more about uh, this uh, double smearing bound. So let's move on to singularity theorems. And we're interested in uh, Penrose type singularity theorems. So in the Penrose type it means that this incompleteness for null geodesics, singularities in general relativity as defined as having in geodesic incompleteness. The Penrose singularity theorems as all pretty much singularity theorems has three kinds of condition. First is the energy condition. The original Penrose theorem uses the null convergence condition. The initial or boundary condition, which is the existence of a trapped surface. A trapped surface is defined as the two null normals having negative expansion or that the surface has negative mean normal curvature. The third condition is the causality condition, which is the existence of a cosy surface. Then with three, these three conditions, we get that there's an incomplete null geodesic with a, a le length less than L, L is the fine parameter. Uh, the proof structure very, very schematically of singularity theorems is the initial condition is telling us that the geodesic starts focusing. The energy condition is telling us that the focusing continues and the causality condition is telling us that there can be any focal point. So this leads to a contradiction which tells us that the geodesic is incomplete. Now the problem with uh, Penrose's uh, really nice singularity theorem is exactly the energy condition. So if we want to apply this theorem to semi-classical gravity, we can't do that because the energy condition is violated. So what we want is to have a singularity theorem with a weaker condition and one that can be uh, satisfied by quantum fields. And we proved such a singularity theorem uh, with Chris Wuster a couple of years ago. So here, the energy condition is not just uh, the Ricci contracted by two null vectors, but it's a smeared over portion of the, uh, of the null geodesic. And we allow for some negative energy. We are in semi-classical gravity. We have to allow for some negative energy. So the bound depends on the smearing function F, its derivatives, and two constants QM and Q naught, 
which in our theorem, we didn't know what they were. They're just non-negative constants. So we have to prove the quantum inequality to see what those constants are. Additionally, we require the uh, null convergence condition to be violated before we measure the mean normal curvature. Since it's violated, that allows for more positive energy after we measure the mean normal curvature. Now, the snack fits well with this condition because using the semi-classical Einstein equation, this snack takes exactly that form. And in fact, we only have a one term here, and we know we can identify the Q1 with the constant B that appears in SNEC. Uh, then we need the initial or boundary condition. So here, instead of having the H just be negative, it has to be more negative than a function that depends on these constants Q0, QM, L, and L0. Uh, that makes sense because we have a much weaker energy condition, so we need a stronger initial condition to lead to geodesic incompleteness. The causality condition is exactly the same, and uh, the result is that we have an incomplete null geodesic with length less than L. To apply this theorem, we use a toy model. Uh, the toy model is that of an evaporating black hole. So the assumption here is that we, uh, we say that the metric is approximated by Zwerchow's geometry near the horizon. Now, the thing with evaporating black holes in uh, semi-classical gravity is that they violate the null energy condition, so we cannot apply the Penrose original theorem. Uh, so in our theorem, we allow the null energy condition to be violated, and so we can apply the theorem. So here is what we do here. We take the uh, mean normal curvature in uh, Schwarzschild in hypersurfaces of uh, constant R and T. And this is the mean normal curvature given by Schwarzschild geometry. And then we take the required mean normal curvature from our theorem to have null geodesic incompleteness. So oh, sorry, they required- uh, one, minute, eight... one, minute one minute left, sorry. Right. Yes, thank you. So the required uh, H depends on the Q1, L, and L0. Uh, so this is, the, this is the picture that we have. P is our hypersurface. And uh, before, uh, before we measure the mean normal curvature, that's the L0 where the NEC is violated. And then L is where the singularity is formed. So I, I, ideally, we like to have a small x, so the p is as close to the horizon as possible. We don't need to go far inside the horizon to have null geodesic incompleteness. And the y close to 1 minus x, that tells us a singularity prediction. Uh, so we have, uh, I have these two plots for two values of q1, which I, I remind you depends on b. So for q1 equals 1, which is the maximum value, the p has to be uh, the minimum p is one fifth of the distance inside the horizon. So it has to be quite far inside the classical horizon. However, if the q1 and so the b is small, then we can go much closer to the classical horizon. Uh, and the small b is well motivated because to have a b close to one, we need to saturate this inequality I showed you before. And that typically doesn't happen. The uv cutoff is typically not very close to the Planck scale. Uh, uh, so um, to, uh, to conclude, uh, I showed you the smeared null energy condition and how to prove a singularity theorem with that. And I also presented a, a very recent bound with uh, smearing in two null directions. And the main question for future research is how can we prove a singularity theorem with this better bound? Thank you. Thank you, Eleni, for your talk. Uh, so one qu very quick question, if there is any. We are long over new time. Okay, so if there are no questions, so Eleni, thank you again for your talk. I uh, invite the next speaker, Andrew Beckwith, to share hey, his yes. slides with us. Yes, uh, let me keep, I, ha I have to go to another session in 10 minutes, so I'm going to keep this exactly 10 minutes. <laughs> okay, very good. All right, don't worry about that. Uh, let me just get this down, all right? Looking at quantization of the, of the, of the uh, wormhole. Okay, now let me go back to you, full speaker. All right, now I'm going to go to share the screen. Mm -hmm. uh, this is, uh, uh, yeah, this is 
the uh okay now we are seeing your slides well your yeah, you screen see my right? slide uh, your screen actually not yeah, your you see slide. my screen okay now which is, is that do you see do you see the wording now i have to keep the short 10 minutes and i'll get out of dodge looking mm -hmm. at a quantization of a weight function for weber 1961 the signals from a weight function at the mouth of a wormhole all right uh, Weber, uh, we utilize uh, Weber. But, but sorry, Andrew, we are only seeing, uh, okay, the, okay, so, so you are right, presenting. It's going to go to wormholes, don't worry. Okay, I'll okay. Get to a wormhole, don't worry about it. We utilize a Weber, uh, uh, initiate the process of the quantization of early universe field to the problem what, be, what may be emitted from the mouth of a wormhole. While the wormhole models are well made and developed, there is yet no consensus of how the, Gravitational weight to other signals from a wormhole could be quantized and made uh, to be informed, showing adherence to a procedure Weber crib from Feynman in 1961. And then I had more to it, and I said it's a cut out of session. We uh, enter, we bring to stay the uh, result given by Weber in 61 again, an initial uh, wave function given it to, which may be able to model. Uh, what happens to the mouth of wormholes? We assume the idea is that Hubble's parameters proportional temperature go to uh, energy proportional temperature. The last part will be enough to isolate the first principle in net frequency value. All right. So here is the Weber block. So we have a later wave function. We have an earlier wave function. This looks like this is the, so as I said, pick one index, pick something that would look like this. So I said, this corresponds to being primarily concerned with gravitational wave, which is what we'll be examining our idea, ideas, EI fix right over here. We we'll use the following is, is phi, the uh, constant. Uh, so, is, so we didn't have you again, Andrew, but we are not seeing any slides. We still see the, the, the person. You see the, the slides. No, we don't see the slides. You do not see the slides. Okay, no, wait we, a minute. We, we see the, 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 the word of the of the contents of the session, not the not your slides. You don't see my slides. This is no. 320. Yeah. No, no, we are not seeing your slides. <sighs> okay, can you I'm sorry, I'm I'm trying not to panic. <laughs> okay. We are seeing wait, your wait screen, a but not your slides. Andrew, you know? <clears throat> Andrew, just unshare your screen and then share it again with the yeah, slides, I'm, please. I went to my screen right here. I went to my screen right here. I'm, I'm at my screen right here. No, you first, see it. First, no, first, and share your screen. I see my okay. screen. I'm trying to see you. Andrew, 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 please listen to me. Please, and share your screen. There's a red button on top. And oh, share it. I see participants share. Because your screen has, has frozen. So first, and, and share it. You see it right now. No, unshare your screen first, Andrew. What? Unshare your screen. There's a red uh, window on top that says unshare screen. Well, click that. Okay, share. Yeah. Not share, unshare. Share. unshare. Okay, I hit share. Do you see it now? No. No, first unshare it. I'm panicking. What do I do? Andrew, 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 uh, calm. Calm down, please. Okay, so do you see your, the, the, red, uh, the red window on top where it says Anshay screen? Yes. So click that. Yes. Click it. My, my computer's all messed up. Okay, let, let me try and help here. Okay, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Sorry. Resume share. Do you see the share now? You have to unshare it first. What? Okay, I've done it. I've done it. Now share your screen. Yeah, share, I share your the slides. screen. I hit the share, share the screen. Slides. Share your slides. Yes. Okay. Yeah, this is my short wormhole document. Do you see it now? Well, yes, perfect. Okay, so go ahead. God damn. All right. Don't um, worry about gonna, it. Okay. Don't panic. Just go ahead. Sorry. Okay? No problem. Sorry. It just is that I was panicking. It just is that I have so little time. No problem. All right. Just go ahead. So what I did 
but here is the uh, here is what was done. Here is what was done by Weber. Okay, this is his wave function. This is the, you have an ensemble right over here. The idea was to reduce it to just simply uh, many indexes, just to one index. Then, which is I set this index i phi h right over here to this being a, uh, this is what you might call from the, uh, this is straight from a uh, general relativity. I put r equal to that. So I put, so what I was able to come up with is I said is i, i fix, it, exponential i of h c4 uh, pi t naught h c r minus r3 here the phi naught and then we have equation one would be rewritten as equaling the phi later equaling to this exponential term uh, the phi earlier examine the behavior of the earlier wave function in uh, equation six <sighs> all right so what I did is I took the Harkle Hawking's wave function, the earlier wave function right over here. This is for Harkle Hawking's, and I took the and I put that right over into here. And I put this summary. This is for general relativity. Then what I said, H, and I said is a here's the H is I would use the Sockards for the H 1.66 G star T squared temperature divided by M Planck. And I put this right over here. And then I said method for using of equation six with interpretation of the results. So I used numerical uh, integration and phi later when I did a numerical integration would be essentially TM. This is the midpoint rule because you'd have something that'd be very close to it plus some small turn left over for alpha one and alpha two. And after I came up with the deck, as I said that the W signal, which you would be get would be KB in Planck H, H bar, the upshots we have in this way to obtain a signal frequency by looking at the real part of equation one, is with a small t initial time step. How to compare with the Kuiper solution and therefore isolate the cosmological constant contribution. Uh, omega W delta T one, and so then I put this right over here and to what you might call the dust solution for the uh, Kuiper wave function. And I said, this yourself was something you could work at the mouth of a wormhole. All right. And then the approximation, this is a preliminary space-time uh, wave function near the mouth of the wormhole using that approximation would be in this form. At the surface of the bubble with space time or very close to what you might call just the mouth of the wormhole, T Planck could be delta T and R would be L Planck. Then, which as I said, you'd be able to determine uh, quantization uh, K equals N plus one half of the lambda H bar. And what I was able to get after a certain degree of work with this said is that you would get a very small constricted frequency very small time step and you would be able to then go to the next question which is if you had that the big picture polarization of signals from a wormhole moth may affect gravitational wave astronomy uh, observations we are referenced 16 and 17 think we have a rate of production from the wormhole uh mouth and so then what i was able to come up with is the, the particle, uh, and I would come up with a procedure. Uh, here is, a, you know, the wormhole production, which you would get, would be equivalent and have to be fixed with respect to this, uh, to this wormhole geometry. This is the density function, which you would be working with in the situation, R squared of four alpha, where the B coefficient is non-commutative. Uh, and you would come up with B of R equaling to this type of formula. This is something that Bizzer and other people would know very, very well. Uh, so, Leandro, it's already time. So, please uh, go to your conclusions and try to finish your talk. My okay? conclusion, I'm going to read it right here, then I'm out. Uh, the first order gets at the rate of production of Planck sized black holes for a. Uh, you would, through that type of procedure, come up with WP over TP 
which is uh, the Planck temperature and the frequency. So in other words, what you would come up with, there'd be a first order rate of production through the mouth of Werner of uh, gamma ray production, approximately two to three. And this is two to three per second. So in other words, what you were doing with respect to a, with respect to utilizing this procedure right over here with certain sets, would be say that you'd have two to three, what you might call very many type of black holes or equivalent type of objects going out the mouth of a wormhole per second. And this itself would be, this would be completely consistent so to speak, which what you might call representation that would be along this sort of line with the earlier, right over here, the Hawker Hawkins uh, treatment. So I came up with, and the conclusion was this. The conclusion is that you would have a rate of production two to three per second, something that going out the mouth of a wormhole, maybe something like Planck black holes or something like that. And that's what I came up with. And so I'm done. OK, thanks, Andrew. Thank you for the, the understanding. Yeah, well, uh, so, I apologize. Yeah. I just no, it's OK. It's OK. These technical, technical things uh, happen sometimes. Yeah, okay, well, so... I apologize. I'm not, uh, I'm not very uh, gifted. When I Could you do okay. me a favor? And uh, how do, how do I uh, expand this? Because I want to uh, click out. OK, I can do it by, by you. That's OK. Okay. You can, uh, okay. yeah, well, I'm going to just okay. leave the medium right okay. now. Okay, thank, thank you. Thank you very you. much. Okay, so we move quickly. Okay, thank, thank you very you. much. Thank you very much. So we move quickly to the last speaker, who is Francisco Cabral. Uh, Francisco, are you there? Okay, so Francisco, can you share your slides with us? You are muted, Francisco. You have to unmute yourself. Francisco, you are still muted. Okay. Can you hear me? Now we can hear you. So please share your slides. Okay. okay. Can you now we can see the slides. <laughs> yes. Okay. So please go ahead. Okay. So thanks uh, everyone for being there and the, the organization for this opportunity. And I apologize for the fact that my talk is not related to wormholes, but uh, uh, I was um, given this time here on this uh, parallel session. So my talk is about uh, symmetries and geometries of space-time. Um, and uh, in particular, the two main ideas of this talk are first, the, this notion that the conformal structure of space-time, the causal structure, is more fundamental than the metric structure. <laughs> um, and the, the second main idea is uh, are, are, uh, the richness of space-time geometries, non-human geometries coming from the gauge approach to gravity. So uh, first of all, from the point of view of uh, uh, the fundamental uh, axioms that give rise to the um, equations of electrodynamics, the, the fundamental equations of electrodynamics are actually uh, consistently uh, constructed in a pre-metric way. Uh, and uh, it is the constitutive relations between uh, the field uh, uh, strengths and uh, the excitations, the so-called excitations, that introduce the space-time metric, but actually it introduces the, the, the conformal part of the metric. And uh, here in Obukov we're able to uh, derive the, the, con the, the, the conformal structure, the conformal invariant part of the metric with the correct Lorentzian uh, signature from uh, electrodynamics. And what we get is the light cone structure with conformal geometry. So at, at the fundamental level, electrodynamics is not related to Poincaré symmetries, nor Minkowski spacetime. And this geometry is uh, related to the breaking of Lorentz symmetry. And, uh, and this is connected to non-metricity, as we will see. Um, so the gauge approach to gravity starts from the localizations of uh, the rigid global symmetries of spacetime uh, coordinate transformations. We localize these symmetries. We get the gauge potentials as the gravity geometrical degrees of freedom, the corresponding field strengths, which are uh, quantities from uh, geometric quantities uh, uh, like torsion and, and um, non-metricity and the uh, uh, curvature. And uh, we get the, the neither currents, 
coming from these symmetries, which are the sources of gravity. So the main idea is that uh, we start from non-rigid, sorry, from when we get uh, non-rigid symmetries, we immediately get non-rigid space-time geometry. Um, and the, uh, for example, the metric affine gravity approach in, in, in this uh, gauge description has the affine group as the symmetry group, uh, the translations uh, semi-direct public with the general linear group. And the gauge potentials are the four uh, co-vectors, co, co the co-frame uh, or the tetras, if you want, and the linear connection, which in general, which in general is a non lorentzian connection, which is related to the presence of non-metricity. I will explain uh, non lorentzian connection. And the space-time geometry includes curvature torsion and non-metricity, as I said. And the metric and the connection are truly independent. The canonical energy momentum and the hypermomentum are the sources of gravity. So we have the four potentials associated to the four generators of the translation group and the torsion as the field strength. We have the 16 uh, connection potentials related to the general linear group generators and we have the curvature as the field strength. And uh, we also can introduce the metric, although we have this perspective that is not uh, fundamental as a connection, uh, but uh, we can introduce to measure space and time distances as a potential. And the field strength is the uh, non-metricity um, tensor valued one form. And the, the, the neither currents, as I said, are the sources of gravity. Um, and uh, in particular, let's look at the hypermomentum, which is the neither current associated to the general linear group. It has a spin part associated to the Lorentz group part, uh, a dilatation current and a shear current. And when we look at uh, the most general linear connection, this uh, term, which is um, the anti has this anti-symmetric uh, indices here, is called the Lorentzian connection. So the other, the presence of the other terms, the trace part and the so-called shear part of the connection, uh, correspond to a non-Lorentzian connection, and uh, which means this. Um, so uh, a non-Lorentzian connection implies the presence of non-metricity because actually this expression for non-metricity can also uh, be, be uh, rewritten as the, 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 the symmetric part of the, of the connection. So uh, this, this is the, 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 the message here, is that uh, the, the presence of a non-Lorentzian uh, uh, connection is related to non-metricity. Uh, the, the connection can also be written as this expression here. So we have the Levi-Civita part, and then this distortion quantity represents the post riemann geometries. Actually, uh, we see here that one part of it is connected to uh, non-metricity, and the other part is related to torsion. Uh, non-metricity has this Bianchi identity on the left-hand side, and uh, we see that uh, if non-metricity is different than zero, then uh, this quantity here, uh, the so-called, um, 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 uh, well, th th this, this quantity here of the curvature is, is different than zero, and this is related to non-Lorentzian connection. So there is a clear relation between non-Lorentzian connections, Lorentz breaking matter with non-trivial hypermomentum, meaning with the uh, dilatation and shear currents, and the non-metricity of space-time. Uh, maybe people are more used to this expression in allonomic uh, uh, co uh, components for the connection. So there's a part related to contortion, another part related to, to non-metricity. And uh, we have these Bianchi identities, uh, which actually um, are analogous to the Bianchi identity of electrodynamics that give the homogeneous equations and the, the magnetic electric conversion. So maybe curvature, torsion, and metricity can be interconvertible. A nice perspective for relativistic astrophysics, gravitational waves, and uh, cosmology, and so forth. Um, the Poincaré gauge theory of gravity is similar, but instead of the general linear group, we have only the Lorentz group. So instead of the full hypermomentum, we have the spin uh, uh, density as the source, one of the sources and the, connect, the connection is so-called a Lorentzian or spin connection. So we can extend the, the Poincaré group to the vial group. 
and uh, uh, the viral group includes delightations. And uh, sorry for this. And the delightations uh, can we can also introduce special conformal transformations to extend the viral group to have the conformal group which has 15 parameters and preserves the light cone structure, but changes the line element. Uh, and also the vial group. We can also extend the Poincaré group to the Citer or anti uh, symmetry groups or to super Poincaré um, symmetry groups who have the super gravity. And uh, a particular case of the Poincaré group is the translational gauge theories of gravity. Um, okay, I'll skip this uh, comment on the vial geometry. Um, oops, sorry. I don't know why the slides are not moving. Just a moment. Okay. Okay. So uh, conformal symmetries might be uh, fundamental uh, in space time, but uh, they are not uh, perfect in, in nature. So a symmetry breaking maybe of cosmological origin might be there leading to the Poincaré group. Um, and then we have the phenomenology uh, applications. Um, and uh, for example, uh, we studied cosmological applications um, and uh, also applications to fermionic and bosonic fields uh, um, a couple to torsion where you have nonlinear dynamics and um, non, uh, non minimal, sorry, nonlinear dynamics, I say non minimal couplings between the matter fields induced by torsion uh, and also gravitational wave applications, for example, cosmological applications uh, within the Einstein Cartan Dirac Maxwell theory, one can have family of solutions in which you have a non singular solution. So the, the square factor has a minimum here. So with Francisco, and, one minute left. One minute left? Okay. So uh, these solutions include a bounce and an, an early acceleration period. And also we can have late time acceleration uh, period. And these things come from spin-spin interactions and bosonic self-interactions and non-minimal interactions induced by torsion. We can have uh, uh, extended Dirac uh, equation um, uh, in this uh, Einstein, Carter, and Dirac, Maxwell uh, theory. Uh, and uh, this breaks the charge conjugation symmetry and the UN symmetry uh, breaking. And also the electrodynamics is nonlinear uh, with complicated expressions induced by torsion. Uh, we can also have uh, uh, Einstein, Carter, with non-minimal couplings explicitly. And uh, in, in, in specific choices of these non-minimal couplings, we can also have parity breaking in the Dirac equation. And uh, uh, this is an expression for gravitational waves uh, in Poincaré gauge theory of gravity uh, in a Minkowski background. And uh, uh, this requires more, uh, more investigation. Um, if I am allowed, I will make some comment on the probing of uh, uh, the post Lehmann geometries. So we need matter with hypermomentum in order to be sensitive to torsion and non-metricity. We don't know uh, uh, very much what is the shear current. Uh, it's probably related to the excitations, spin to excitations of hadrons. Um, and the uh, torsion can be measured by precessions in, in, in intrinsic spin systems. And non-metricity might be measured by some kind of uh, pulsations in matter with uh, uh, hypermomentum uh, shear currents. And we obtain, for example, uh, uh, effects of torsion on spinners. And uh, uh, allow me to pass here to some results here. We have some energy transitions in uh, levels that are induced by torsion. So the spin uh, interacts with the background torsion. And if it is up or down with relative to the torsion, we have different energy levels. So we can search for these energy transitions, these hyperfine structures. And uh, also in the case of non-minimal couplings between torsion and the Dirac uh, vector, we found we can find also energy levels and with signatures of parity breaking effects coming from these non-minimal interactions. <clears throat> I'm so sorry for being so fast in talking, but uh, there were a lot of material. And uh, yeah, these were some tables with some analogies between the gravity approach in the gauge theory and the young Mills fields, and there's a lot to, to say about space-time in these analogies. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Francisco. Uh, if there are any questions in the, in the audience, um, or any comment? 
Okay, so otherwise, so so this is the end of the session. So I would like to to all the speakers and all the, the people that attended to this uh, to this session and yesterday's session. So we had some, some very nice talks. Uh, I hope that you have uh, we all have learned a, a little bit about what what is going on in our community. Uh, so I hope to to see you in this meeting. So uh, Francisco, I don't know if you want to say anything. Thank you, Diego. So. Just thank you, thank you as well. What you mentioned also, thank you very much to all the speakers yesterday and today. It was a very, very interesting uh, parallel session um, and hope to see you again, maybe in three years time in presence. So I don't know if the Marshall Grossman's will continue, but uh, hopefully that they will. Anyway, this has been a very nice session. So I'll make, my word, I'll make uh, Diego's words mine and uh, thank you very much and keep well, okay? Goodbye everybody. Thank you Goodbye. very much. Enjoy the day.